webinar on sustainable development, public and private finance, and leadership. I extend a very warm welcome to all the renowned speakers and the eminent participants who took out their valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this international seminar. We are honored to have you all with us. Sanjeevius University, Kolkata was established in 2017 and in a short span of time has made a global significance. With the Jesuit principles of faith and service, the university has become one of the foremost educational institutions in the country, promoting excellence in education and research. I feel proud to say that this international seminar has been organized by Sanjeevius University, Kolkata with an objective of promoting global collaborations towards multidisciplinary research culture. Let me introduce the concept of this seminar. Today, the struggle for environmental sustainability and social justice go hand in hand. And at the core of this linkage is not simply the pursuit of healthy ecology, but rather imagining a better future for humanity. Efforts to combat climate change, transform agriculture, preserve biodiversity, eliminate plastics in the ocean and build a more inclusive globalization should all be considered as intrinsically linked. Acknowledging this reality is the starting point for triggering shifts in the whole system. This is what we need to see in 2022 and beyond. Way back in 2015, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which is viewed as the foundation for a new social contract, a social project that can provide people with a decent standard of living through the ecological transition towards sustainable development. And of course, global warming is also damaging agriculture, biodiversity, and land. It is clear that this toll of damages is not simply about the decline of nature. Humanity's future is at stake. This international seminar is focused on how to enable the transformation that is needed across the financial system to realize the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. This will require changes in financial analysis, financial policy and regulation, as well as financial practice across the assets in banking, capital markets, investment funds and the insurance sectors. Momentum is building, but it is still not at the speed or scale required. Breakthrough approaches will be needed to reconnect finance with the real economy. Therefore, connecting economy, finance, anthropology, and media with breakthrough approaches is the way out to accelerate the progress in sustainable development and also sustainable finance. With the multidisciplinary priority, this seminar has drawn on expertise from across the world and from leaders in academic institutions, finance, media, research, and civil society. This seminar is the marker of the success of St. Javier's University, Kolkata, in allowing us to meet some of the brilliant minds of the country and also internationally acclaimed professionals who have become the speakers for this occasion. With all these words, I am extremely delighted to pronounce the first speaker for the day, who is none other than Honorable Vice Chancellor of St. Javier's University, Kolkata, Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj. Before introducing speaker one, let me make a request to the audience that for all sessions, kindly type any question you want to ask or address to the speaker in the chat box as far as possible within the limited time. We will try to address your query in the last 10 to 15 minutes of each session. I take this opportunity to introduce Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, who is a Jesuit of the Calcutta province of the Society of Jesus, a dynamic personality. He is the founder, vice chancellor of St. Javier's University, Kolkata, and also professor of economics. Father was the former rector, vice principal, principal of St. Javier's College, Kolkata. He also teaches economics in this renowned institution. Father is an educationalist, administrator, and a philanthropist. Besides educational institutes, he is also the founder president of SNEGAM, an NGO that provides quality education to underprivileged children and promotes the education of 
female children. His initiative, College to Village and Village to College at St. Xavier's Kolkata and St. Xavier's University Kolkata is University Kolkata is a noble effort in transformative education. Dr. John Felix Raj is director of the Gothels India Library and Research Society. He was a member of the West Bengal State Education Commission. He was also the vice president and secretary of the Bengal Economic Association. His selfless work in the field of social development through education has made him the recipient of 14 awards, including Bongo Bibushan and Shikharatno from Government of West Bengal. Dr. John Felix Raj is a prolific writer and has authored and co-authored nine books. He has also published numerous papers and articles in journals and newspapers. I welcome Reverend Father Dr. John Felix Raj, Vice Chancellor, St. Xavier's University, Kolkata, to address this August gathering. Over to you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I don't know I am worth uh, such a long introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. At the outset, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you, uh, participants as well as the resource persons. I wish all the best for a very fruitful flow and exchange of ideas among ourselves because we have speakers from many organizations. And I see the list. There is one resource person, professor of operations and IT from Philippines. And we have another one, deputy head, equities and corporate risk division of Bank of Italy. We have also a professor from Banaras Hindu University. And we have Dr. Deepak Kumar Behara, Vice Chancellor of Kalinga Institute of Social Studies. And we have our own Father Aurekya Swami from St. Xavier's University. So when I see the list of speakers, the galaxy, and I'm sure all the participants will have a very fruitful session. St. Xavier's University, Kolkata is focused on realizing the sustainable development goals and the importance of the global collaborations in producing genuine learning outcomes. The International Virtual Seminar on Sustainable Development, Public and Private Finance and Leadership is organized today by the Research and Development Cell of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata. And it plays a very pivotal role in catalyzing multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and translational research culture. This international seminar will deliberate on the enhancement of accountability of the nations with an overview of getting near the objective set forth by the United Nations in 2030 agenda. With a multidisciplinary priority, the seminar will allow adequate space for sectoral, geographical, and disciplinary views. Through this international virtual seminar, an effort is made to connect sustainable development with economy, with finance, media, anthropology, and science, and the realization of the achievement of sustainable development goals with changes in a globalized economy as we see today. The convener of the International Virtual Seminar is our own Dr. Mononita Kundudas, Professor of Law and Director of Research and Development Cell of St. Xavier's University, Kolkata. I am very grateful to her and to her team for organizing this virtual international seminar. Allow me now to share with you some of my own reflections on the theme of today's virtual seminar. 
for sustainable development. Finance and leadership are two very important factors. And in today's global context, we need to promote both public and private participation in the areas of investment and leadership in promoting and realizing the SDGs. There is a greater need for a healthy collaboration between public and private agencies. Unless and until there is a concerted effort, it is very difficult to achieve these time-bound goals. There have been many efforts from our side and these efforts must continue with renewed financial participation and very focused leadership. India is critical in determining the success of the SDGs globally. At the UN Sustainable Development Summit in 2015, our Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi noted, I quote, sustainable development of one sixth of humanity will be of great consequence to the world and our beautiful planet. It will be a world of fewer challenges and a greater hope and more confident of its success, unquote. According to the survey, that is India's rank in HTI 2019, is 131 compared to 129 in 2018. This is out of 189 countries. By looking at the subcomponent-wise performance of HDI, India's GNI per capita has increased from US dollar 6,427 in 2018 to US dollar 6,681 in 2019. And it would reach about 7,000 in 2021. And life expectancy at birth has improved from 69.4 to 69.7 years respectively. Niti Aayog, the government of India's premier think tank, has entrusted with the task has been entrusted with the task of coordinating the SDGs, mapping schemes related to the SDGs and their targets and identifying lead and supporting ministries for each target. In addition, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation has been leading discussions for developing national indicators for the SDGs. State governments are key to India's progress on the SDGs as they are the best people to put people first and to ensure that no one is left behind. The UN country team in India supports Niti Ayok, union ministries and state governments in their efforts to address the interconnectedness of the goals, to ensure that no one is left behind and to advocate for adequate financing to achieve these SDGs. The economic survey 2020-2021, as presented by the Honorable Minister Nirmala Sitaram, states that the combined center and states together, combined social sector expenditure as percentage of GDP has increased in 2021 compared to last year. The expenditure on social services like education, health, and other social sectors by center and states combined as a proportion of GDP has increased from 7.5% in 2019-2020 to 8.8% in 2021. In India, let me focus to some extent on Indian efforts. There are schemes that further encapsulate India's progress across the SDGs. Number one is Sashak Bharat 
and Sabal Bharat, that is to create an empowered and resilient India. The second is Swach Bharat and Swast Bharat, that is clean and healthy India. And third is Samagra Bharat and Saksham Bharat, inclusive and entrepreneurial India. Number four is Satat Bharat and Sanatan Bharat, sustainable India. And finally is Sampanna Bharat and Samrit Bharat, prosperous and vibrant in India. Now, all these schemes, of course, many more schemes introduced by the center and the state governments, they continue to do their best. India is one of the fastest growing and emerging market economies with a young population and burgeoning innovation and business ecosystem. With the GDP of US dollar 3.46 trillion in 2021 and 22, India strives to become a US dollar 5 trillion economy in 2025. And the target for 2020, 2031 is 7.5 trillion US dollars. And India pursues an inclusive and sustainable growth trajectory by stimulating manufacturing, building infrastructure, spurring investments, fostering technological innovation, and boosting entrepreneurship in different fields. In the spirit of South, South cooperation for realizing the 2030 agenda, India supports developing countries through US dollar 150 million Indo-US Development Partnership Fund. In this spirit of regional and global partnership and the country's commitment to leave no one behind, India steps into the decade of action, drawing confidence from its experience in addressing challenges. Government of India will continue to work collaboratively with all domestic and global stakeholders to accelerate efforts for a sustainable planet for future generations. India has shown its strong commitment to the global goals in the last several years. After the SDGs were adopted in 2015, India's dedication is shown in its efforts to electrify rural families, ensure that girls attend schools and stay in schools, offer sanitation and housing for all, equip young people with the skills they need to complete in the global labor market. And India also has, also, has also made significant progress in the use of data for effective policy making and monitoring progress of so many schemes introduced in order to achieve the targets. It's my conviction that all of us, government, central government, as well as state governments, public agencies, and as, as well as the citizens of the country, if all of us take leadership, and that leadership individually and collectively, we shall definitely achieve this SDGs. The words are lovely, dark and deep, but we have promises to keep and miles to go before we sleep. I take this opportunity, of course, to Wish you all the participants of the seminar and also the organizers that St. Xavier's University took this bold step so that our own faculty members, as well as some of our students who participate in this program, and also those, the invited guests, invited participants, 
benefit from this virtual international seminar so that we have the flow of ideas on such a theme as sustainable development goals introduced by the United Nations. Practically every country, of course, has been showing interest. Every country has been taking efforts in realizing this. If you want to have a peaceful, a humanly developed, and a united world, a global community, I think all of us, all the countries, all the governments, whether central or local, have to work towards this targets so that we achieve the time-bound goals. I want to thank the organizers. Once again, I want to welcome the eminent resource people, the speakers who are there to address our participants today. Welcome and wish you all the best and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. Uh, I, th uh, I would like to thank. I, sh uh, I shall be. I shall be open to some questions, ma'am. Yes, Father. Uh, for, for your thought-provoking address, I thank you, Father. And uh, now, uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, you can type in the chat box, uh, which we can put forward to Father for his viewpoints. It looks that I have been understood very well. And so there are no, there are no questions. I'll just wait for some time and uh, yes, yes. Uh, go ahead. I'd request the technical uh, people to see that uh, the attendees are able to type in the chat box. They should be allowed to type in the chat box. I think they are allowed, yes. They can do it if they want. Okay. So uh, in the meantime, uh, let the let our attendees uh, think of question and putting uh, to you father and we hope that all our attendees have understood uh, your lecture father very well but then uh, one question certainly comes to my mind is that how as uh, educationalist we move towards a sustainable development goals how can we ourselves uh, take certain bold steps or efforts to make sustainable development, education, a uh, reality? That, that, that's a wonderful question because, because we are all here as educationists. Uh, we have some resource people definitely from the banking side and from the other side. But then since this seminar is being organized by an educational institution, St. Xavier's University, and the participants are also educationists, uh, it's a relevant question that what is our participation at two levels. One, of course, is as institutions. What do the universities, colleges, especially higher educational institutions, what is their contribution towards achieving these SDGs, number one? Number two, of course, is in terms of the student community and the teaching community. I see it in various ways. Number one, first and foremost, it is the responsibility of every educational institution, including schools. They don't want to leave out the schools, uh, especially at the higher levels, to bring in awareness of these SDGs. That the United Nations has come out by 2030, we must be able to achieve these SDGs because it is the sustainable development that is required today. We have been for a long time discussing about development. 
And today we are talking in terms of human development and that human development must also be the sustainable development. And so every institution is called to create awareness among the faculty members and students that there are such goals set by United Nations. And there are such goals, United Nations means, of course, almost all the countries together, standing together, they have set these goals, number one. And number two, the higher educational institutions might initiate ways and means of reflections, ways and means of generating ideas, uh, what these SDGs mean, and how can we, of course, definitely uh, implement these. And number three, of course, the institutions have to emphasize on research. You see, faculty members are, uh, the scholars are students, can these institutions involve and do research? How best these, especially in terms of social sector, especially in terms of education, in terms of health, how can these SDGs may be implemented at the regional level and at the state level or at the national level? How effectively they can be implemented? Because the educational institutions have a very significant role to play in realizing the targets of these SDGs. And so education, they also have to come together. There must be not that we stand as islands, that we try to do uh, just a piecemeal achievements work, but then educational institutions also have to stand together collectively so that we put our minds and hearts together in making this because all of us want a humanly developed, a sustainable development at the global level, not only at our regional level. We all want that the globe develops that there is peace, there is joy, there is development, uh, there is enough to eat, uh, there is no poverty in the world. This is what we want. And I think to achieve this, educational institutions have a greater role to play. First, to start with creating awareness among students and reaching up, of course, to the stage of research so that we could help the state governments, we could help the central governments, and we could help international organizations and NGOs who are making up making efforts to realize these SDGs? Thank you, Father. Uh, this was. Uh, I think the entire our audience has been benefited through this uh, elaborate uh, uh, clarity which we got on as to how, as educationalists, we can move forward uh, towards realizing the sustainable development goals. Uh, I, I also request to the panelists here, if they want to put any question to Father, you can unmute yourself and you can put your questions to Father. As well as to the audience, you can write in the chat box. One thing, one thing at the global level, you see, when every country is is insisting on trying to making efforts to realize these SDGs. Each country is doing its best. And there are countries who are coming together and collectively making efforts to realize this and supporting one another. There is a lot of support between the countries. That's number one. Uh, number two, while suppose say for instance, India is making so many schemes you know, and these schemes are for empowering India, making India resilient, and uh, a clean India, healthy India. Now, such schemes, of course, not only develop our own country, of course, definitely, but at the same time also giving inspiration, giving support, and giving a, a room for other countries, especially at the South Asian level or at the Asian level, that we are also taking initiatives that they could learn from us and we also can learn from them. So such are the schemes that are being promoted by our country. And so far there has been tremendous amount of success, progress, and I'm sure 
that there is still room for further development and there is still room for uh, making more schemes and progress in various levels and various fields. And I'm sure many countries are trying to do their best and such efforts will definitely by 2030, we should be able to achieve, if not 100%, at least a sizable percentage of the SDGs. Thank you, Father. I saw a hand rising. Please don't raise your hand. You'll be un, un, it is, uh, you cannot unmute yourself. Uh, please write in the chat box. We don't know how to write over. Thank you, ma'am. I don't think there seem to be questions. Things are very clear. So you can go on. Thank you, Father. Uh, our next, uh, thank you, Father, for the entire, such a wonderful session. Our next speaker is Ronald Malisdem, but he's, uh, he's already there in this uh, forum. So, uh, Dr. Ronald, can we go ahead with your presentation? That's, that's, that's Dr. Ronald from Philippines, is it? Yes, yes, yes Father. Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Dr. Ronald, welcome, welcome. Thank wonderful. you, thank you. Wonderful yeah. to have you with us, yes. Thank you. I'll share my presentation. Uh, thank you, Father. We conclude session one. Thank you. And yeah. uh, it's a bit uh, early. We begin with session two. Yeah. Go now, uh, let me introduce... Uh, thank you, Father. Now, let me introduce speaker to Dr. Ronald Malkdem, who is a professor of operations and IT at Ateneo Graduate School of Business, Philippines. Also, the current chair of San Miguel Yamunora Packaging Corporation, SMYPC, Production Council for its domestic and international facilities, Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and China. He is assistant operations manager of San Miguel Corporation, managing its beverage packaging business with 20 plus years of solid track record in the beverage industry. He has also, he has already held various assignments in quality assurance, product development, technology management, project management, construction, management, and operations. With his extensive experience and graduate studies, he is currently an adjunct faculty at the Ateneo Graduate School of Business under the Department of Operations and Information Technology. He teaches MBA students, courses in applied mathematics and operations management. As an advocate of agriculture and education programs, he is the current co-chairman of agriculture and education at Metro Angels Chamber of Commerce, Industry, Philippines. He is also CEO and president of Uzbong Sibol Agri Agriculture Ventures Incorporation. He is a licensed chemist graduate of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and MBA of Ateneo Graduate School of Business, Philippines. He has a postgraduate studies in MS Materials Engineering, Bachelor of Laws, and at an OCCE, Leadership and Management Development Program. Today, his topic of presentation is Balanced Scorecard for Finance and Leadership. I welcome Dr. Ronald Malikdem to make his presentation. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Do you see my uh, presentation material? Yes, yes, it is visible. Please go ahead. Good day, everyone, and uh, good day to all who are attending the St. Saviour's University, Kolkata International Conference. Thank you, Dr. Mononita, for the introduction. My topic today is Balanced Scorecard in Finance and Leadership, and I will share my thoughts, stories, experiences, and values about this learning course. Balanced scorecard in finance. 
Traditionally, key performance measures for finance are focused on the top and bottom line, revenue and net income. Thus, in the mid-90s, Kaplan and Norton devised and conceptualized the balance scorecard. The balance scorecard model shows four perspectives in business, learning and growth, internal business process, customer, and finance. This ventures out of traditional measures focusing only on the financial perspective. We need to develop metrics and key performance measures for each of these perspectives, collect the required data, and analyze this informa information relative to each of the respective views. We can outline the balance scorecard on a progressive chain from learning and growth, internal business processes, and customer and financial perspectives as we develop the balance scorecard. We call this strategy map. Metrics in the learning and growth focus on workforce improvement, continual improvement, CSR programs, and other measures that business may identify, then moving to internal processes, which cover operations efficiency, inventory accuracy, energy, IT, environment, safety, and the rest. As we improve measures on the internal processes, we will increase customer satisfaction, which can be measured through customer satisfaction indices, compliance in management systems, and improve quality ratings. Ultimately, the improvements from learning and growth, internal processes, and customers will result in increased financial results, including, including better profit levels, revenues, managed costs, and working capitals, and assured financial compliances. The balance scorecard focuses on the key performance measures as presented on the strategy map. We can also see through it that we can execute the necessary action programs and strategies that can apply to improve the critical performance measures against the four perspectives. We start with the vision and mission at the core, followed by the four perspectives on learning and growth, internal process, customer, and finance. This perspective is bounded by the business core values and business ethics. The strategies and executable programs we can implement to improve the learning and growth indices includes learning pro leadership profiling, performance management system, organizational development, management of change, competency development. For internal processes, we can use business improvement processes such as SIPOC, voice of customer, deployment process map, and opportunities for improvement process map. Lean manufacturing to manage the eight ways can also be used, including Six Sigma. For customers, we can implement integrated management system programs. And for finance, we can do economic analysis, ratio analysis, marketing management, including SWOT analysis, ANSOF matrix, cost management, supply chain management, and the rest. Looking further at the financial perspective on the balance scorecard, focusing on the balance sheet, we can see the different strategies that we can implement for financial management. Financial management aims to maximize shareholder value by executing necessary programs towards assets, liabilities, and equity. For current assets such as cash, we should put them to minimum against the need of the operations. Use benefit versus cost for accounts receivable. For inventories, identify the economic order quantities. Time value of money through the use of net present value, internal rate of return, and return of investment can be a strategy for property plant equipment. For assets, diversify your portfolio based on the modern portfolio theory and utilize the weighted average cost of capital as a tool managing liabilities for long-term debt. Use the benchmark industry for the debt to equity ratio. Finally, maximize net income to maximize sales and minimize cost for retained earnings. Now, for balance scorecard on leadership for sustainability, self-awareness will be the key and a core value. 
Magis driven leadership will be my will be the focus of my talk. Magis has been ingrained to me. It has been a living mantra that I have heard, seen, and followed suit. The call to be more, a call to excellence. This leadership scorecard will focus on my personal experience as I lay down the principles of the, this Ignatian value. I will focus on my life experiences, stories, and snippets as I, lay, as I leave the value of magis. But what is magis in leadership and, lead, and to us leaders? About the book of Chris Loney on heroic leadership, Magis driven leadership inevitably, inevitably leads to heroism. Heroism begins with each person considering, internalizing, and shaping their mission. Whether one works within a large organization or alone, no task is motivating until it is personal. And it is sustainable only when one searches magis, a reflexive daily habit. A magis-driven leader is not content to go through the motions or settle for the status quo, but is relentlessly inclined to look for something more significant. Instead of wishing circumstances were different, magis-driven leaders either make them different or make the most of them. Instead of waiting for golden opportunities, they find the gold in the opportunity. I have four pillars and areas that I have that has been the rock as I leave the value of magis. It's the three P's and a C that I will share to you. I have always valued the pursuit for excellence and strive to do, to do my best in everything, challenging the status quo for the two decades of my career. I started from my humble beginnings as an analyst and quality practitioner. My first job was QA, then moved through time to different organizational assignments, from quality to product development to process and technology management. Strategic projects management and operations. I have been with my company for almost two decades now, and I'm very grateful for the opportunities and responsibilities they have entrusted to me. Currently, as operations manager managing its beverage packaging business here in the Philippines, and also as chair of our production council for over 20 manufacturing facilities in Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and China. With such significant tasks and responsibility, work is hard. But with the value of magis, I, as, I, uh, as I took this uh, course, this has, been, this has given me and opened my eyes to the importance of this Ignatian principle, which has been the guiding light as I traverse my daily life. Going back to the pillars and areas of magis that has been the anchor for me, for my magis-driven leadership, I would like to share my first P, perseverance to learning. For over 20 years, pursuing education has been the route I have unceasingly followed. As we move around organizations and move up our career ladders and business ventures, skills, technical know-how, and competency development has been side-to-side -side partners of our personal, personal and career development. I have been affiliated with six academic institutions in the past years, from studies in chemistry, materials engineering, to law, business management, and on ongoing graduate studies on public leadership and doctorate in business administration in California International University. I believe we should never stop learning as life never stops teaching. And I would like to focus more on this uh, topic as I share my experience and stories when I took two courses at the same time, my MBA and my LMDP, my Leadership and Management Development Program in 2018. In 2018, I started my journey to my MBA program. There has been even a story that during my orientation seminar during that time, I was coming from the northern province of the Philippines to avoid traffic and to ensure that I would be on time for the event. 
I came very early in the morning and was given the early bird award. So fast forward to 2021, I completed my MBA and successfully graduated. As I was taking my MBA in 2019, my company asked and listed me to another program at the same time, which is the Leadership and Management Development Program. Immediately, I talked and consulted with my wife as she was also an HR manager. She was giving conservative thought that I, I'm already taking MBA and with the current responsibilities at work, it would already be tough for me. But with grit, passion, and challenge to the majesty, to the Maji status quo and values, I took the challenge. So during those times on weekdays after work, I would typically travel to my class 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And on weekdays during Fridays and Saturdays from 4.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. It was fun, exciting, and challenging and complex experience as I took two program courses, graduate program courses simultaneously with the rigorously week, weekly reports the group works, readings, and papers for the two courses, I always look forward and connect to my classmates as my support system as I go through with my studies. With the value of pursuit to excellence, I completed my leadership and management development program as an academic citation awardee, won the second best capstone project award, and was awarded an MBA gold medal. My second P, persistence to help. With the pandemic, we saw the importance of balancing work, career, and health, a balanced work-life lifestyle. Both physical fitness and mental well-being, we have gone through community quarantines, working from home, and challenging our physical and mental states. For us to pursue the values of magis and excellence, I believe our health is essential and we cannot compromise it. For years, I have found a new love for enduro athletics, doing marathons, duathlons, triathlons, and Spartan. I found refuge in these areas to balance my physical and mental fitness against the stresses of work and life. As an enduro athlete, we have support groups also, I am a member of a triathlon team here in the Philippines where we support one another as we do trainings and races. We follow necessary health and wellness regimens and training programs to join races. I have participated in dozens of athletic events and races around the Philippines. Doing races is both a physical and mental challenge. Physical to finish the lengthy race, which usually takes two, three, four, six hours, and even more, and mental challenge to focus to finish the race as you endure and manage the pain. And for you to go through that challenge, necessary health conditions and preparations are needed. As I persisted towards health, I, it gave me a new horizon for magis challenging my capabilities. Finishing tremendous challenges such as the 750 kilometer challenge, 150 kilometers of running and 600 kilometers of biking. Finishing four hour races and notably was one story when I joined one Spartan event. It took me more than six hours to finish with the obstacles and kilometers of racetracks. Usually, when I take a race, my wife joins me, staying at the finish line. As she was expecting that I would finish at the fourth hour, she got worried because I was not yet arriving at the finish line. During those times, I was exhausted and needed to rest in the racetracks, mountain hills. She went to the medical unit of the organizer, describing me and asking if they brought me to the nearest hospital. As I arrived at the finish line, she was sobbing and crying, and I consoled her telling her that she should not worry as I always persist towards the finish line. And such story, I am thrilled that I was the first Filipino to be featured in Humans of Triathlon. Health, in we health is wealth, and we should always strive for it as a critical factor in our pursuit for excellence and magis. And my last P, passion for service. When I entered 
graduate school, the first words of thoughts that struck me were we, the mission on, we believe that expertise without integrity is empty and integrity without na, uh, competency is ineffectual. Integrity and competency without service is irrelevant. When I took my entrance exam for my MBA in 2018, those words of thoughts were projected on the screen in our exam room. Words that will always come to our minds are service, nation building, and love of country. The love of the land. And I'm very proud of what I, of what I have learned to be of service to our families, friends, communities, to the people, and to love our country. And I'm very grateful with the opportunity and privilege during my graduate studies as I was given two elected responsibilities in my graduate school as president and as representative. And I will be forever grateful to my graduate uh, institution for such opportunities. The pandemic is one of the most significant challenges we have faced and our country faced during our lifetime. In March 2020, lockdowns and community quarantines were implemented. Many of my countrymen, Filipino people, lost livelihoods and even lost lives. It was a challenging chapter in our history. As a leader, during the early part of the lockdown in March 2020, our group in the Philippines immediately saw the need to extend assistance to our communities. We formed an initiative we call Tulong Abe to focus on growing and assisting our communities. We started small. Our first assistance then was focused on medical frontliners giving necessary PPEs and food items. But with the vast diverse network we have, we grow and serve our people's needs. We continuously grow our initiative with the full support of alumni, students, local government units, private companies, and volunteer NGOs. For over a year, we distributed over a million breads and biscuits around the Philippines. When Typhoon Ulysses struck the Philippines, we immediately formed our task force team to deploy the necessary assistance. One of the significant concerns then was logistics, as many of the areas were not possible on small vehicles. We tapped our network and get, were able to get assistance for tracking and necessary donations. In a couple of days, our help was able to reach North Luzon. We also, need, also saw the need for modular learning for our young students in the public schools. We formed an initiative to give necessary printing materials, printers, envelopes, inks, bonds, papers to identify public schools. We also installed civil structures such as washing stations as requested by their school officials. And one of the latest initiatives that we were able to implement was an outreach mission simultaneously done around the Philippines. As a community leader, we have institute, instituted social development initiatives. For our communities in, in, northern of the, in northern of Philippines, we have extended technical training and market development programs to support their livelihood, focusing on root crops such as cassava. We have partnered with companies, LGUs, and other institutions. In partnership with local leaders, we also develop urban farms to address food security, faster farm to table programs, and minimize food wastage. We have also created livelihood programs such as bread making for the poorest of the poor in the different barangays. As a business leader, I'm very grateful for the program we were able to implement as an initiative and co-developer co-developer co -developer for the process and product. With the government units partnering with us on this program, we are able to assist our farmers 
with their product to address the risk of possible wastage to serve our young Filipino people for their nutritional needs, reaching hundreds to over a million of young students in public schools. And with all these services to our communities, we are thankful to the recognition we have received from the Department of Education, local government units, and even a resolution was given to us recognizing our efforts. We have been featured in, in different media outlets, TV, Sunstar, interviews in Business R and CLTV 36. Passion for service and love of country will always be a call to all of us to be more for the greater glory of God. I have three P's and a C, which I consider as pillars for magis. The three P's are persistence to learning, perseverance, uh, perseverance to learning, persistence to help, and passion for service. And the most critical part and anchor for me is the C, the center of it all, God and family. I have always put God and family at the center of my life. All actions, decisions, directions, goals, mission, and purpose emanate from this center. My values and principles are anchored on this now. As we go with our daily lives and as we pursue our majesty driven leadership, we will always face ups and downs, wins and losses, victories and challenges. And as we pursue excellence, we may not always be at our prime. When such time comes, always go back to your center. Recharge, rest, find strength, and return stronger. God and family will always be our strength. Let's continue to be more. Let's pursue excellence for the greater glory of God. Ad majorem de gloria. With all this, I would like to share some key takeaways with you on the balanced scorecard of the Magis Driven Leadership. You may want to consider the following characteristics, criteria, and parameters. Perseverance to learning. A leader who values learning and will accept critical and constructive criticisms towards improvement and growth as a better leader. Persistence to health. A leader who values health as a primary policy and a healthy population leads to a healthy economy, thus a healthy nation. Passion for service. A leader with a genuine heart and sincere heart towards the love of country and service to the people. God and family at the center. A leader who puts God and the family at the center for every action and decision they make for the welfare of the country. I hope this personal sharing will be of great help to every one of us as we pursue sustainability developments towards the UN goals. This sharing will serve as a will serve as the basis for Magis driven leadership and as we pursue our goals, missions, and purpose. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Ronald, for such a wonderful presentation of uh, where we see that we do have our personal goals, we do have our professional goals, and we need to grow sustainably, not only to for our acad as an say professional, but also in our family life. Also, we need to imbibe the sustainable goals. Uh, a wonderful presentation, and uh, certainly we would like to the audience here to type your questions in the chat box. Please do not type in the YouTube link. Uh, please type in here so that we can put forward the question to the speaker. In the meantime, uh, Ronald, uh, can we uh, talk a bit on the health uh, is wealth? How do you see this when we uh, talk in terms of sustainable development? Yes, I mean, uh... I'll just stop share. Okay. Thank you, Monanita. Again, for sustainable de development, I, I, I discussed some personal uh, thoughts, right? And uh, for me, it's 
starts first with with the self eh? with with every one of us if we want to go for sustainable development and leadership is key leadership will always start on on your own self and for me the key for leadership will is what like like uh, like i presented uh areas in terms of uh continuous learning areas in terms of ensure uh uh health and areas towards um uh, excellence towards passion for service because all of this no all of this if we want to have a better world no there are a lot of uh, thoughts right now no remember for for businesses they are already into ESGs no? ESG met metrics and uh which is focused on environmental social governance and even for business they are already out of the the normal uh uh discussions on the traditional uh top line and bottom line they are now focusing on what we call triple bottom line which is profit people planet and uh all of these are really focused on on all on all of our topics on sustainability but i was able i was just focusing on on the personal uh area wherein if we want to have a better world if we want to have this uh un uh sdgs to be successful then we should uh encourage uh leadership within within ourselves now within ourselves and those who will be our our, our leaders no the, the, those i believe will be a, a, a good criteria no as we choose leaders who will lead us towards this uh sdgs Thank you, Ronald, uh, for such a vivid uh, answer to this uh, small question. But it does uh, make a lot of difference when we try to uh, sort out our, uh, say, uh, our wants. Now, uh, regarding, uh, say, personal experiences and, uh, say, sustainable development goals regarding finance regarding economy so as uh, say as an individual how do i see myself to help to boost the economy of my country how do i contribute okay yeah. so uh critical here is what uh, as discussed by father uh, previously uh awareness awareness we cannot proceed to the the goals if the if the population is not even aware what are the goals what are these 17 goals right so for uh, these sdgs so that's the, that's the critical education will be key if there will be uh, education will be key because when you develop our education to include the sdgs in the learning uh, in the learning courses maybe and we, and we can integrate those uh, SDGs as early on the, the on the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels, then that will be a good help already because you, you start with awareness. Second, of course, the government will also implement their necessary policy. Policy will always be key. You know, policies. What are the policies? What are the directions? What are the directions of the government? And that's the second part: awareness, policy. And for the last part, like what you said, what is what is for me as an as an individual, and th that comes down to the role of the citizenship. What is your role as a citizen uh, towards that sustainable uh, sustainable development goals? Every one of us has, has our own roles. So, and uh, as long as we 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 pursue those, we we are able to execute our own roles on our, even a our, our small a small. Uh, small steps that we are doing collectively that will be already be a big help towards uh, uh, towards our goal. So uh, for me, critical will be awareness. Uh, second is, of course, government directions, government policies will be key, and the citizen participation, the, cit the citizenship's role towards this, those, the, the SDG. Every, every effort it's a big effort for me, whether it's small, whether it's a big project, a small project, every effort, as long as it's aligned towards the SDGs will already be a big effort if it's already seen as a, on, a collective, on a collective effort by everyone.
Thank you, Ronald. Uh, one last question from my side. Uh, can we make the economic growth inclusive? Economic growth inclusive. Uh, of course, you know, uh, it's 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 in the participation. It's the in the participation of of everyone. You know, if everyone, uh, uh, we 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 need to. There should be. Uh, I for me, you know, uh, critical here is what is the roadmap? Do we have a roadmap towards uh, the? Of course. The problem is this is the big problem. If everything is just uh, just thoughts, just uh, okay, this is just uh, words. For example, as long as there is no concrete roadmap, then they, they, you cannot go towards that direction, right? So, uh, what is the roadmap? What is the strategy? What is the plan? Uh, and and for 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 that plan. To, to 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 be inclusive we should or we should ask all stakeholders to be part of that plan it cannot be just government doing the plan for the whole it cannot be the uh, non government doing the strategy for the whole it it is not only the church it's not also just the uh, academic institutions it should be the whole stakeholders basically there should have proper representation of all the stakeholders coming up together and creating a roadmap that is customized to your country's need aligned with the directions and policies of UN SDGs, right? So critical for me next is the, the roadmap. Because you cannot just copy the roadmap of the Philippines and apply in, the, in India because that's that would be different. No? It, it should be customized based on what is the current state of the country and of course, based on the current uh, scenario, factors, internal and external factors, that is uh, unique towards uh, the economy of a certain uh, nation. Thank you, Ronald, for such a wonderful answer. Uh, now, we wait for a few uh, minutes for the audience to uh, write questions in the chat box. Some of them have been writing in the YouTube and uh, people are uh, stating good session, but uh, we want questions from the audience. Uh, I think this, it's requested. Please type your questions in the Zoom uh, chat box and we wait for some time. Dr. Moninita, uh, before we, uh, I will just add also no, in terms of leadership. There are two, two areas of leadership. What I discussed was more of the trait, the trait of a leader. But there is also what you call adaptive leadership based on the process. No? So we should always look at it. No? There is the trait. Trait is already a, 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 a prerequisite, a good starting point, starting point towards leadership. But there is also what we call adaptive leadership, what, which focus on the process. What is the process? What is the interaction? What is the transaction? What is the, the, the take? between all of these stakeholders towards the vision, towards the, the mission and vision at the end. So it will always be a process. No, It will always be a process. The leaders will just be one of the actors and there will always be followers, but there should always be this interaction because this is a process towards the end goal, towards the, the, the target mission and vision at the end. Thank you so much, and uh, I hope our, our all audience have understood your uh, lecture so well that there is no question at all. Everyone has understood with it. Uh, but then, yes, it, it certainly uh, everyone is watching, and uh, uh, we get a comment that it's a very good session. Uh, so, uh, with this. Uh, a very uh, with this a vivid lecture which you have put forward to us as uh, uh, we move forward and i would like to thank you ronald for such a wonderful presentation and uh, with this we conclude session two uh, thank you so much now uh, request to the audience that uh, our session three uh, is from 
140 onwards. Uh, so we'll be moving, we'll be joining uh, all of you post lunch at uh, 1.35 p.m. for session three. Uh, our third speaker will join us at 1.35. And till then, uh, because we don't have uh, much questions here, uh, so I would like to conclude session two. And thank you, Ronald, so much. Again, see all the panelists and all the attendees at 1.35 p.m. post lunch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Hello, Pierre. Uh, we start your session at 140. 135. You are, uh, can you unmute? Pierre, can you unmute yourself? Hello. Hello, Maranita. Yes. Yes, yes. So uh, nice that you have joined. Uh, our uh, second session uh, got over a bit early. So we'll be starting our your session uh, from 1.35 uh, p.m. India. Uh, mm -hmm. In just, uh, say, uh, 15 minutes time, we'll be starting your session. 15 minutes, OK. So uh, I wait uh, on mute without video, if you agree. Yes, yes, uh, you can uh, you, you can be without mute, with mute. I'll just announce at uh, Indian Standard Time 135 for your uh, session three. Okay. You can also share your screen. Okay. Yes, I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
So we are in the uh, process for commencing with the session. Uh, Pierre, are you there? Yes. Okay. So uh, we start your session at 1.40 IST Indian time. Uh, so you can share your screen uh, in the share screen if, uh, during your presentation. Yes, sir. I, I cannot share it at the moment. Okay. Uh, so uh, what I can do, I can share the screen for you. Uh -huh. It would be helpful for you. Yes, it tells me that uh, there is uh, someone else that is sharing uh, the co its content. So, uh... okay, uh, I'll just. I'll ask the uh, uh, the computer person to stop sharing so that you can share your screen. Just a second. Just be on the. Yes. Yes, uh, a very good afternoon to you from India, Pierre. Uh, so you Thank can share you your screen. Anita. Yes. Do you see it? Yes, yes, it's visible. Okay, so good morning to everyone. Uh, yes, uh, I take this opportunity to welcome uh, Pierre, uh, we are moving to uh, session three, and uh, Pierre, Mr. Pierre Luigi Mijilurti, Deputy Head, Equities and Corporate Risk Division, Financial Risk Management Directorate, Bank of Italy, Italy, Rome. <coughs> now, Pierre, uh, since July 2022, is Deputy Head of the Equities and Corporate Risk Division in the Financial Risk Market Management Directorate, Bank of Italy, Rome. He graduated in economics in 1997 from the Sepezia University of Rome and earned a postgraduate certificate in environmental corporate management from LUISS in 1999. Since joining Manca di Italia in 2001, he has worked on portfolio management, financial risk controls, and sustainability issues. He has gained experience in managing Bank of Italy's staff pension fund and the own fund equity portfolio. His topic for presentation is sustainability in Bank of Italy's investments 
the case of the equity portfolio. They are uh, the, uh, requesting the audience to uh, type your questions in the chat box so that we can put forth the questions to Mr. P Pierre Luigi for his viewpoints. Over to Pierre, Mr. Pierre Luigi for your deliberations. Okay. Thank you, Minister, for having invited me. Um, I'm very happy to have you begin this opportunity. Um, so I will uh, get uh, started. Uh, in the next minutes, I will be talking to you about uh, uh, the integration of sustainability in, in Bank of Italy's investment, and especially the, uh, in, in, in equity portfolio management. That, as Monolita said, is, is uh, what I is my job, is my current job in the bank uh, at the moment. So, uh, what about uh, the agenda? The agenda. I will I will talk to you about. Uh, First of all, about the framework. So, we'll illustrate the framework of uh, of the, our choices. Then I will uh, switch to the strategy, and then at the end, I will present some uh, of our <clears throat> sustainability uh, results. Um, please, uh, if there are any technical problems, uh, uh, just let me know. So. Uh, the framework. The framework is uh, a very complex framework, as you know for sure. Uh, there are many dimensions in the slide that I just uh, showed uh, a few. Uh, from one side, there is the market. In the market, in financial markets, uh, sustainable investing can be, uh, has been growing very a lot in the, in, the, in, the, in the last years. And um, but also the risks uh, associated with it have been growing. So there have been there is there is a risk of misuse of the this label that is so uh, used today of sustainability. And this is called uh, this is referred to as a greenwashing uh, risk. And so. Uh, the authorities and the standard setters knowing this began a process of issuing uh, different uh, issuing laws, norms, standards uh, in order to uh, to make uh, the investment decisions uh, more solid and uh, well founded. And so uh, we there are a lot many of them uh, what it will take hours just to speak about uh, standards and norms. Just to name a few, we have standards about uh, climate issues, like the one issued uh, from uh, the task force uh, for, <clears throat> for uh, climate-related financial uh, disclosure, the TCFD. We have green bond standards, then uh, there are many action plans, for example, the action plan from the European Union, and also obviously as regards especially the climate dimension, uh, we have uh, international agreements like Paris and Glasgow agreements, and now you know there, are, uh, there is also the ongoing discussion at, in Egypt uh, about further <clears throat> developments. Then we have central banks. Central banks uh, uh, acted, and we, we, I will talk about it uh, in, in uh, more details in a minute. There is also the society that is ch changing, and is um, a part of the society is push pushing towards uh, more awareness, more action, uh, especially on climate, but not only. Uh, but there are also many different uh, feelings and opinions about uh, those issues. And as you know, and, and those issues uh, are also influencing uh, uh, politics. Then, uh, as a matter of fact, we have to remember, uh, uh, we have uh, many sustainability issues that are developing. So climate change is happening. And uh, also other, especially environmental uh, uh, and social um, issues are showing 
uh, themselves uh, very well in the, I mean, in the, in the news, but also in, uh, in, in, for example, investment management. So the, um, the framework is very complex. Uh, we have many dimensions that are related one to each other. Uh, obviously, for me, it's impossible to talk about uh, uh, all of these aspects. So I will focus for, for the sake of time. Uh, I will touch up only upon uh, some of these issues. And I will uh, mention especially, I will highlight especially three elements that I think are quite relevant for, for the topic of my presentation. The first is the institutional framework. So uh, uh, in Europe, the European Union issued uh, several um, those uh, regulations and among, the, among other things issued a, a climate action plan and a sustainable finance plan uh, in order to to promote uh, integration of sustainability at various levels uh, and also the reduction of, of, of risks. Uh, and this uh, is something that uh, has, has changed the, uh, the regulatory framework, the regulatory environment. Uh, on the other side, uh, on the central bank side, uh, the euro system, that is the system uh, formed by the ECB, the European Central Bank, and all the banks, uh, central banks of the countries that adopt uh, the, EU, the euro as a currency. The euro system has uh, communicated uh, many times uh, and in many ways that uh, is acting on uh, sustainability issues, especially on climate related ones. And uh, among other things, uh, last year uh, it declared that uh, um, it has a common stance to integrate uh, climate related consideration in, in its non-monetary investment portfolios and also to disclose informations information sorry about uh, about those dimensions uh, and I will talk about uh, I will show you how a disclosure later at the end of the presentation then uh, as I told you before there is also a network uh, it's called network for green the financial system that it has been formed by by several central banks around the world uh, also the reserve bank of india is a member of this uh, this network and this uh, and this is an entity that is uh, conducting a very important technical work uh, especially as regards climate uh, related issues uh, for example uh, is um, the NGFS is estimating models, is estimating uh, climate scenarios, and uh, it is making those uh, all those data available to to academics, to investors uh, around uh, around the world. And uh, the NGFS is also issuing many recommendations uh, about uh, integrations or uh, integration of. Uh, climate consideration in investment. So there is a lot of, uh, of action. Why this emphasis, especially on, on climate? Because uh, you can see that I'm talking especially about this. And the reason is that uh, climate change is something that is uh, happening. Uh, in, here in the slide, you see a um, an image from the US National Weather Service that show the, the complex equilibrium that uh, uh, exists between uh, Earth, atmosphere, and uh, the radiation from the sun. And this is a complex equilibrium that lasted for thousands and thousands of years that now is somehow being challenged because of, uh, of atropic uh, emissions. This is uh, probably the one of the most 
important problems of our time, not, not the only one, obviously, but one of the most important. And uh, it won't be easy to fix. It won't be easy to fix because uh, it requires a massive change in, uh, in the economy. It requires uh, some sectors, especially electricity, transport, uh, manufacturing and buildings to reduce emissions that now are about uh, 40 gigatons of CO2 to something around zero in uh, less than uh, 30 years. So there is a, a huge challenge ahead of us and uh, central banks and Bank of Italy is aware of this. Uh, and is aware also, the bank is aware also of something else, uh, is aware that uh, not uh, all the externalities, uh, all, all the social, uh, environmental and governance dimensions are reflected in, uh, in, financial, in, the, in the prices that form on financial markets. Uh, is aware also that there is not uh, clear evidence on the correlations between uh, those factors and the financial performance, uh, probably even because there are many data issues that are still, uh, that need to be solved because data, this is a, a young, uh, uh, is something relatively new uh, in the academic sector and there are still many, methodologic issues about how to estimate, how to measure uh, um, environmental, social and governance uh, dimensions, the ESG dimensions as uh, uh, they are called. And then uh, there is also the, um, the awareness that the companies that uh, are more aware of ESG issues uh, are less exposed to risks, especially to operational, legal, and reputational risk. And usually they are also quite uh, innovation oriented and have a lower cost of capital because of those uh, uh, better operational uh, and risk management capabilities. So this is the, the framework that lead the bank to issue a responsible investment charter. Uh, this is only one of the actions that the Bank of Italy uh, took. There are also other, but uh, about, for example, uh, financial supervision. But uh, here uh, it's not my top, this would be outside my topic, so I will limit to in the investment dimension. And the responsible investment charter that you can also find by clicking on the icon uh, uh, of, the pre of the presentation, if it works well, uh, is, um, um, declares the vision of the bank about sustainability. Uh, declares also uh, to be more concrete what, what are the inspiring principles, what are the exclusion criteria that uh, are adopted uh, and <clears throat> the scope and also it declares some commitments. Uh, there are three commitments. One is to promote, promote sustainability. The second is, is to integrate ESG criteria. And the third one is to publish to disclose, if you prefer, uh, results and uh, analysis. So uh, those commitments, in my opinion, are quite important because they reveal uh, that uh, the charter adopts broad concept uh, of uh, sustainability, um, a, a, a concept where we take into account ESG, environmental, social, and governance risk in, in investment decisions, but also we commit to communicate their impact on ESG uh, profiles. Okay, so 
this is uh, the, the concept of sustainability that is underlying our uh, charter. And uh, to be even uh, more clearer, <laughs> I will read this uh, this is a, this passage from the charter that says that the risk to sustainability, particularly climate related risks, might have negative effects on the soundness of, of individual intermediaries and on the stability of the financial system. They might interfere with the monetary policy transmission channels to the point of compromising the objective of price stability. Lastly, they might affect the Bank of Italy's capital strength, which is a keystone for maintaining independ independence, so as not to be conditioned, conditioned politically or administratively for, and for carrying out its institutional functions. So there are many important uh, issues at stake in, uh, in, this, in this charter that are about financial and price stability and also central bank independence. Um, this, uh, this charter, uh, this, uh, the charter is, uh, was the last uh, part of the framework uh, that uh, inform our investment decision. Now let's turn to strategy in order to be more also practical. And uh, I will adopt uh, a top-down approach. So I will begin from the strategic level. And the strategic asset allocation is a process that uh, allocates uh, that uh, provides the optimal allocation at, across different asset classes. So it says, uh, for example, in that uh, we need to invest uh, an X, uh, 50 percent in bonds and 30 percent in equities, uh, and uh, the remainder in what uh, in something else. And uh, this process takes into account our uh, risk preferences, uh, and the constraints that we have to respect, and also the peculiar risk that the, fa the bank uh, faces as a, an institutional uh, entity. Um, here there is an important disclaimer that I have to make. I'm talking only about uh, uh, the so-called investment portfolio uh, of the bank that is formed by all the assets that are not, that are, that are not related to monetary policies or policy and also by foreign reserves. So we are not talking about the whole uh, balance uh, sheet of the bank. And the process is on, uh, from a technical standpoint is very complex, but uh, I won't get uh, go into detail. I will only say that uh, it takes into account asset and liability uh, together in order to um, estimate uh, properly financial risks, uh, to take into account uh, the, the risk from uh, institutional functions and to ensure capital protection, even in adverse scenarios. In all the process, on this process, uh, there are some constraints that are considered about sustainability dimensions. The strategic asset allocation process uh, then uh, is uh, uh, the input for the equity portfolio management process uh, here, um, we need to select securities. So uh, here uh, we need to balance different uh, trade-offs. One is about uh, mark uh, how to balance market neutrality. So we need to avoid to give uh, uh, signals that could be misunderstood. Uh, and, and that could be perceived uh, in uh, li uh, like generating conflicts uh, with the bank institutional functions. 
uh, and uh, sustainability. So to ensure neutrality, the, the bank uh, um, use market benchmarks and uh, manage its portfolios in order to be as close as possible to this uh, benchmark. It's called uh, passive management. Uh, secondly, in order uh, to limit costs, uh, rebalance this portfolio on, um, periodically, not, uh, not daily, but with a high, uh, sorry, lower frequency. And then uh, there is also a third trade-off that, uh, that is between the, uh, is about the sustainability dimension. Uh, this is the trade-off between the climate uh, matrix that we use and the other ESG profiles. Uh, very often, uh, if you manage a portfolio, for example, if you want to reduce uh, emissions, uh, you can uh, decide to exclude some uh, sectors or some companies that uh, uh, show a good performance uh, from different in different uh, aspects of the of the ESG dimensions. So it's not easy to find uh, the correct trade-off between. Uh, uh, these two different needs. Uh, a typical example of this is uh, the utility sector. The, uh, for example, electricity companies, uh, they usually have uh, emit a lot of uh, CO2. So uh, they may be the, you may be tempted to reduce the investment on these companies uh, because uh, they are uh, emitters of, uh, of carbon, important emitters. But uh, on the other side, uh, if you do this, uh, you, you divest from companies that are usually, not always, but usually acting very a lot on, uh, on ESG issues because they are more aware than others of their importance. And also uh, you divest from companies that are uh, also from the companies that are planning uh, to be carbon neutral. So you are divesting for, uh, from, those, from those companies that need more capital in order to finance the transition to net zero. So as you can see, it's not uh, uh, that easy to achieve, uh, to achieve a, a proper integration of ESG profiles in, uh, in the portfolio. Um, this is a slide that, that I put it for in order to recap. Uh, it may be useful or maybe for to make things clear. So we, I talked about a strategic asset allocation level that identifies the share of the portfolio to be invested. Uh, in, in each asset class, we consider uh, government bonds, supranational bonds, uh, for example, from uh, international organization, equity and corporate bonds. And the uh, objectives of, the, of this process are to preserve uh, the value of economic capital, so the so-called capital strength of the bank uh, in the long run and also in adverse scenarios and also to improve the ESG profile also by reducing the carbon intensity of uh, equity and corporates. Then there is a second step that is the selection of securities. This is uh, achieved by, um, this is made by replicating a benchmark in order to be as, uh, as market neutral as possible. And uh, the objectives are obviously to improve the sustainability dimensions, but also to preserve diversification and to limit portfolio turnover. So to limit, uh, it means to limit uh, limiting costs. Um, this can be achieved in different ways. In this slide, I show you 
uh, six categories uh, that are used by the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance. Uh, I will uh, very quickly go through them. The first one is uh, the screening. You can exclude companies that not, do not comply with your ESG criteria with uh, some kind of international or national uh, norm. Uh, you can, uh, on the other side, uh, uh, use a positive screening, a so-called best-in-class approach. So you can select or weight more companies that are performing better on ESG profiles relative to their peers. Third, you can integrate, so you can incorporate ESG criteria in your models in various ways. Uh, and this is obviously the more sophisticated way to to consider ESG dimension. Then you can also uh, choose to invest uh, in order to have a uh, quanti quantifiable impact on, on some on a specific issue that can be an, an environmental issue or a social issue. Uh, obviously, this is um, something very I, I, I'm, I'm peculiar, so it cannot be extended to the whole portfolio usually. Then you can also invest, invest on, a, on a theme. For example, you can invest in, uh, in the energy transition, or you, but also outside the ESG world, you can invest, uh, for example, in technology or, uh, or in demographic uh, in companies that are exposed to demographic changes and so on. Then there is a dimension of engagement and voting. So that means uh, exercise to exercise uh, your ownership rights in order to influence com companies' behavior. This uh, also is something that can be made also outside the, the SG, in the SG world, but, but it's something that is very important in, if you want to integrate sustainability. Uh, all these strategies are not uh, mutually exclusive. You, you, cannot, uh, you, can, you can use uh, more than one uh, at the same time. And, uh, and, and this is what we do. Uh, here I show you the three pro portfolio that we manage directly. And for those portfolio, we apply exclusions because we exclude uh, tobacco and also we exclude the, all the so-called controversial weapons and also the companies that uh, are not compliant with international laws about uh, uh, work uh, rights. Uh, but uh, uh, besides the excluding companies, we integrate uh, ESG data in our financial modeling uh, with an approach that select with a quantitative model uh, the, the best in class companies in, uh, in, each, uh, in each sector in order to achieve uh, a good uh, ESG performance, but also to maintain, maintain uh, market neutrality, so to be uh, adherent to, to the benchmark index. And this uh, approach is uh, adopted uh, in very similar ways uh, in, uh, for the Italian portfolio, for the Eurozone portfolio. Then we have also a thematic portfolio uh, that is a portfolio that invests in uh, companies that gain uh, substantial revenues from energy transition. Uh, that means uh, uh, from re renewable, uh, renewable energy, electric mobility, energy efficiency, and green buildings. If you remember, I showed you a slide about uh, the sectors that are more involved in the uh, in the transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, and uh, we were talking about uh, transport, about uh, electricity, about uh, buildings, about uh, industry that are the four uh, sectors that are involved also in our thematic uh, portfolio. Um, so, 
So this is uh, the description. I hope this is not too technical of our of what we do. Uh, so if you are wondering what, what are the results, the, we, we published the last uh, this year in May uh, a report, our first report on sustainable investment and climate related risk. Uh, even here, you, you should find the the link uh, embedded in the uh, in the image uh, in the representation. Um, the the report uh, has a lot of of uh, of data inside about uh, our investments and uh, here we report uh, i reported just a few uh, uh, in order to show that the performance the the, the sustainability results of the of our portfolios are quite uh, good if compared with the with our benchmark indices so we with the, the market we we call, we invest in uh, the carbon footprint is 37 percent points lower uh, the carbon intensity that is a measure of um, of the emissions compared to the to the sales of if the company also is 24 percent lower and uh, even uh, other environmental dimensions show a good performance uh, compared to the benchmark um, on average uh, the, the, the results are better on social governance and also environmental issues there are also there are there is obviously a room for improvement uh, on some some specific aspects, uh, but this is uh, what we are working on uh, now, obviously. And so uh, I don't know if I had been too, too fast, but uh, this was uh, uh, what I wanted to present you. And I thank you for for your attention and I'm here to answer your questions if you have uh, any. Thank you, Pierre, for such a wonderful presentation on uh, finance, sustainability growth, climate change, investment of banks towards uh, climate. So uh, I would request the participants here to type your questions in the chat box. And in the meantime, uh, Pia, there are some questions from my side towards you. Like we are talking of uh, finance sustainable growth. Uh, so how do we see this globally? You are talking of for the bank in Italy, but uh, can we see this sustainable growth investment uh, globally from uh, from our side, or from do we see it in the country's perspective only? Uh, do you mean uh, the growth in investments? Uh in sustainable investments around the world? Yes. Uh, there are uh, many uh, data about this. Uh, the, the, for example, the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance uh, that I thought uh, before uh, is uh, publishing every two years a report on uh, sustainable investments. Uh, and they say that uh, uh, now it's it, it is in the order of um, maybe four, 40 trillions of dollars. Uh, so it's, it's a huge uh, part of the financial markets. So obviously here there are many uh, um, caveats, let me say. So uh, th there are many things that have to be said because the first one is uh, how to define what is sustainable investment. Uh, you can use, uh, um, uh, you, you can you can be, how can I say, more conservative or less conservative in defining uh, what is uh, sustainable. As, uh, and, and this obviously will change also the, the numbers that you see in this process. Uh, it's very important that some uh, uh, regions in the world have been issuing also legal standards, uh, but um, for example, uh, the European Union is uh, 
has been producing a lot of, of norms about it, but uh, this is not uh, spread all around the world. So it can create some problems in computing uh, the, the, the real number. Uh, however, I will say that uh, if you, um, the, the next uh, report uh, from Global Sustainable Investment Alliance should be published, I think, in a few months. And uh, it could be the, I think it's a good reference uh, point, uh, at least to uh, a starting point to understand the, dim the dimension of this market. Did I answer or I don't uh, hear you? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, really, this was the answer we are looking for as to the clarity which we are seeking regarding uh, global uh, growth in finance and uh, the role of banking sector. But uh, I have one more question for you. Uh, as I was thinking on this, uh, say, are there any specific risk uh, to climate investment for bankers? Specific risk, for, yes. I think uh, climate uh, risks are, are very relevant for, to to bankers. Is it, this is a, a wonderful question, but it's also very, uh, um, how can I say, complex to answer because uh, there are many dimensions to be considered. Um, but you mean central bankers or bankers, uh, investment bankers, because... Uh, 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 specifically investment bankers. Uh, because so uh, right now we have a lot of on climate financing from the banks. Uh, there are um, usually, uh, we, we can distinguish uh, climate risk into different uh, categories. One is uh, the so-called transition risk. And the, the other one is the physical risk. And both of them are relevant for, for bankers. So uh, the transition risks are all the risks that are associated with the changes that uh, can happen in technology, in laws, and also in, uh, for example, in market uh, or in consumer preferences uh, 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 related to climate. For example, uh, to be more precise uh, on the technology point of view, a new technology that changes the way to produce uh, something. Uh, for example, the switch to electric uh, vehicles. The, on, from the regulatory standpoint, the new regulations that are introduced to limit uh, in carbon emissions. From the market point of view, the switch of um, possible switch of consumers to to, more, to greener products. These are only example, obviously, but all these uh, things can influence uh, the um, companies, uh, for example, manufacturing companies, and uh, therefore they influence also the, uh, the, the investments of the, of the bank. Because if the bank uh, lo gives loans or invests uh, in equity of those companies, is, is uh, the bank is exposed to the same risk that the company faces. So, if the company, for example, loses market share because uh, uh, it doesn't invest in a, in the in a new technology, just uh, this uh, can lead to a greater risk of, uh, of default. This is uh, one, just one example of, of transition risk. On the physical, uh, physical risk, maybe it's easier to understand because it's the, the, the risk uh, from climate events. So flow, floods, uh, droughts, uh, wildfires, and so on. And this is a... Uh, a risk that can affect uh, company uh, company assets uh, directly, and, uh, and so, so uh, indirectly also the the bank uh, books. So that, so this is uh, uh, in a nutshell uh, the bank um, investment banks, uh, but also commercial banks are exposed. 
uh, to, to companies uh, because they lend to companies, but also they lend to uh, to individuals, for example, for uh, buying uh, uh, houses and uh, indirectly, and they are exposed to, to climate risks. Obviously, estimating this is very, very complex. Uh, in uh, Bank of England, uh, and then also uh, European Central Bank and other central banks in the world uh, performed uh, some stress climate uh, stress test uh, uh, in order to gain some estimates uh, uh, and you can find something in the in the also on the internet on the results of the of these uh, exercises did i answer Yes, it is very elaborate answer to one any specific say, risk I have asked for, and you have discussed the entire uh, say arena on that issue. Uh, thank you so much, Pierre, for uh, your wonderful presentation. And uh, do you have any uh, suggestions as to how uh, in India we can look for towards more uh, say investment in the finance for, for climate change issues? Uh, more investment? Uh, do you um, do you mean from the public sector? Uh, yes, from the public sector. But I think that uh, this is um, a very good question. I I can say that um, to make I can give you a, maybe a, an example of what the European Union is doing about this. That maybe uh, I don't know if this is this set an example, but maybe <laughs> it may be studied in order to uh, to see the pros and cons. Uh, the European Union uh, produced a, a plan, uh, the so-called Green Green Deal. Uh, plan in order to make the economy to, to, to make the economy fit for uh, for a low carbon uh, world and this is a very very complex uh, plan that encompasses a lot of uh, actions on several uh, dimensions so for example there is the um, this uh, commitment to to exclude to avoid the the sale of uh, of uh, internal comb combustion engines uh, from 2035 for example so if, uh, in little more than 10 years we will will not have any more new uh, internal combustion engine uh, cars uh, uh, to, 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 to purchase here in Europe. But uh, uh, among other things, uh, you need uh, also to channel investment uh, in order to make the transition possible. And in order to achieve this, uh, you need several uh, pieces of uh, legislation. One, uh, first of all, you need uh, to define what is green and, and not green. So you have to issue a taxonomy to, in order to identify what you consider a green activity uh, or a brown activity and in order to make it easier for a bank, for investors to, to, to know what uh, they are investing in. Then uh, you, know, uh, you need also uh, to issue standards in the, for the financial market uh, in order to uh, to avoid greenwashing risk. Uh, so uh, you need to identify precisely what is a green benchmark, what is a green a green uh, financial product, uh, uh, and so on. And third, uh, there is also a need to to integrate ESG dimension in the uh, financial uh, supervision uh, world, 
because the central bank or the financial the supervision authority um, must know how to check if the companies are delivering uh, uh, on this uh, uh, issue and and I think uh, and and let me th uh, think for a moment. Uh, we have benchmark. We have uh, uh, yes, uh, the taxonomy, and also you need uh, to promote investments by also channeling uh, public funds directly. Obviously, so uh, you may you have to make public funds available for uh, green projects uh, and make plans. Uh, 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 clear plans about it. For example, uh, if you want to enhance uh, renewable energy, you have to declare what is your objective and uh, in how many years you want to achieve it, uh, how much, how many gigatons of uh, gigawatts of uh, energy you want to generate from, I don't know, from solar, from wind, uh, and so on, in order to, and uh, you have to. Um, find form of um, public uh, financing and of uh, public and private partnership in order to uh, achieve this. So this is a very, very, very uh, wide uh, challenge for, for, a, for, a, for, for, a, for a country. I, I may, I, I'm for sure I'm not being complete because it's very, it's very complex. I hope I answered. It was a sensitizing uh, presentation, and such a you have dealt with in such a wide issues. Thank you so much. Uh, I would request Pia to uh, you for you to stop screen sharing so that we can move on to the next speaker. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, we um, from St. Jewish University of Kolkata extend a warm uh, stay. Welcome and also uh, to you on uh, such an important issue that you have deliberated on today. Thank you for your presence, uh, for taking out your valuable time and joining us here in India. Thank you so much, Pierre. Uh, thank you for in having invited me. Thank you. Uh, with this, we uh, conclude session three and we move on to session four. Okay, bye bye. Good luck. Thank you. So commencing session four. On to our next speaker, speaker four, Professor Shishi Basu, Professor Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, Head JMC, Banarshan University. Dr. Sishir Basu is a professor at Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, Banaras University, Fulbright Fellowship in Communication Technology, Newhouse School of Public Communication, a total of 13 scholars have completed their PhD degree under his supervision from Banaras University, and one research scholar completed MPhil degree under his supervision from Assam University Silchar. A total of seven candidates are currently working under his guidance for their PhD degree. Sir has conducted and organized more than 20 workshops on various subjects. He has participated and presented papers as a resource person in many national and international seminars, project scheme principal investigator in UGC major research projects on the status of Hindi journalism in Hindi speaking areas in India, principal investigator UGC research project scheme, on population communication, principal investigator NCTC, on science communication, principal coordinator on science communication, coordinator scheme, innovation program, health communication. His publication includes books, science communication, a reader, Banners University, Varanasi, experience in film appreciation with Alessandro Monti and Rosalie Carroll, publisher Kolkata. He is the editor of the BHU. Journal of Communication Studies. Dr. Sushur Bashu has uh, more than 25 journal publications. 
His topic of presentation is Little Steps for Art Care Communication is the Key for Sustenance. With this, I welcome Professor Sushil Bashu and sir, over to you for your lecture. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mononita. Uh, happy to be here and uh, speak about sustainable development and communication. Uh, my topic is a uh, little step for earth care. When I say earth, I mean um, earth and all living and non-living being in earth, so in the planet. So that's, that's the earth when I say we include ourselves also in that one. And uh, we say little steps means our own individual steps and community steps, uh, not at the macro level, not big things, not huge things, not global steps, but little steps, step by step, we will be able to heal the earth and make it sustainable. Sustainable because it's uh, is the question of existence, is a question of living, growing and sustaining. So that's why I have put my title as Little steps for earth care and communication is the key because we need to develop a culture and that culture is dependent on communication and communication is culture and culture is communication. That's how we need to move forward. So I would like to put my uh, videos, uh, the presentation on here, PPT, it is. Sir, you can share screen and double click. It is at the bottom. Yeah, I have put it there, but it's not coming. No, I do not need this. So, uh, can you can share? share yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you? I'll, I'll share the screen for you. Sir, you stop sharing. I'll share the screen. Okay. I think some uh, issues I'm getting with the sharing. So can you share from your side? Because uh, from me, I'm not uh, able to share your presentation from my portal. So just yeah. share screen and on the desktop, you just double click on the base. It's coming whiteboard and other things. I do not need this. How do I get my desktop? Okay, sir, I'll, I'll just try this. Uh, just a second, sir. Yeah, we got it. So is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, should I control it from here or from there? Uh, sir, here I have to control, sir. Okay, okay. I, I want to have the first slide. 
I'll move on with the slides. Yeah, next step, next, uh, next slide, next. Yeah, so what I have done is to take out of 17 developmental goals, sustainable developmental goals. I have chosen seven of them because I think they are interdependent and they are related also to uh, Millennium Development Goal. And so uh, sometimes I'm a little baffled as to why uh, the Millennium Development Goal is no more being mentioned because uh, there were some basic issues with regard to health and those are being carried over uh, here, but they are to be mentioned so that we can move ahead and we would know how to sustain uh, those as well as these. Now, good health and well-being, which is uh, number three. Uh, health is always related to well-being and well-being means that we are able to sustain ourselves. We are able to uh, live a life that is meaningful. And quality education is number four. Quality education, we know how much it is necessary for our country because uh, UN would say that 90% uh, of our graduates are not employable. So from that point of view, we need to focus on the quality as well as quantity. But many times I think we are focusing mostly on quantity and not on quality. Clean water and sanitation, we know the, uh, the number of people who are not having uh, clean drinking water. Uh, can I go back? Okay. And uh, responsible consumption and production is something that also would sustain us because 45% of our children are malnutrition. And if you see the statistics in articles, in newspapers, and uh, in many of our uh, scholarly writings, you'll find that almost 30% of the food that India has um, is, is being wasted. And this, uh, if we put two together, we would see that the, the number of, uh, uh, of uh, malnutrition children would come down dramatically. Uh, climate action, uh, we are all talking about it. We know how it is. Uh, we feel now the heat as well as the cold. And this year, the, the monsoon has, has shown that there is something wrong with the climate. Uh, life uh, below water, uh, there are reports that the plastic uh, uh, particles have reached the deepest part of the, of the ocean. And uh, that is because of the life on earth. So the last point that is life on land is connected with the life below uh, water. So they are all interconnected. And if we address all these things, then our life or the earth uh, will be uh, sustainable. Next point. Um, I would uh, like to place to you certain issues. They are uh, not random, they are all connected. And if we pay a little attention, then we'll be able to connect them laterally. Like say, for instance, National Forest Policy in 1951 said that forest and tree cover in India should be about 33%, not only in India, around the world. Why 33%? Because they are saying that in order to make the earth sustainable, we need to cover the earth, at least uh, the plain land, with 33%. And they have divided also 60% of our hills should be covered with forest and uh, with trees and 20% of the plain land should be covered with trees and forest. And if we see the statistics as of 2021, it is only 24.62%. So we, were, we are falling below the required sustainable percentage that is 33%. And we are falling below by 9% of it. Uh, people are poor in India that we need to accept and about 230 million people uh, are poor. That means they are not having enough of food to sustain their health, their body. Uh, our foreign debt, uh, where the money comes from, we were listening to someone who is working in bank and made, made a presentation about the bank. Um, 153 lakh crores, our foreign debt. And only eight years back, it was only 53 lakh crores. So in the last seven to eight years, we have borrowed 100 lakh crores. 
So anybody, any Indian born today would be debted to the, the banks, international banks. Indian Himalaya, the range is uh, covering only 31% of the forest. You know, the 60% uh, should be the ideal one for sustainability, but it's only 31%. That means there is a lot that is to be done in order to make our Himalaya to be there as it is and make it sustainable. 440 million Indians do not own an inch of land. In their own country, they are landless and they will have to say that this is our country. So there is something wrong with that. Our Gangetic Plain once upon a time, not long back, was uh, having or cultivating 56 varieties of paddy. Today it has come down to about six. So species are dying. And the next point is that the 132 species are endangered in India. Uh, going out of India and going to the outer space, uh, we see that uh, there are about 2000 active satellites going around the earth. And in that, we have 34,000 debris of 10 centimeter, and there are innumerable thousands which are less than 10 centimeter. So we need to clean up our outer space too, otherwise there will be a problem in, in the future. And we were talking about education just a little while that we said 90% uh, of our uh, graduates are not employable. We still uh, are struggling with uh, 287 million illiterate people in our country, which is 37% of the world's illiterate people. Next slide, please. Now, currently, um, these are the big issues that uh, uh, we have to address as a nation. There are two most polluted rivers out of 10 most polluted river of the world, Ganga and Yamuna, Yamuna, they are in our country. Uh, the big dams have been driven out from the Western countries, developed countries, but we have about 5,000, more than 5,000 dams. They are completed and they are operationalized. And 400, more than 400 mega dams are being constructed. And we know that dams in the long run are detrimental for uh, sustenance. So we need to either stop them or break them into smaller dams and there should be a kind of movement that, uh, so that we'll be able to uh, you know, have smaller dams and not big dams. And every year, uh, the Eastern part of Bihar is flooded, uh, you know, because of the huge dam that we have. Uh, on Ganges there. Uh, I'm very concerned about, uh, this has been in my mind that though we are talking about hand wash uh, a lot, but we are using different kinds of soaps and they are chemicals. Hand wash would carry these chemicals into the water bodies at the surface, as well as uh, down the earth, into the earth and thereby affecting and polluting the water bodies that help us uh, you know, in the long run when we take them out. So hand wash, bathroom cleaning, chemicals that we are using today, and since uh, many of the habits of the urban people are being adopted by the villagers, by the rural people, so they are moving now into a larger part of, of the country. And in the long run, probably all our water bodies will be contaminated by uh, the soaps and the other chemicals that we are generating uh, to keep ourselves clean. Sanitizers, all kinds of sanitizers that we are using. And uh, 1.4 billion people using these chemicals, soaps, sanitizers, and we do not have a good discharge system. So in the long run, we will be in trouble and we will not be able to sustain ourselves. All kinds of industries pollute from steel to tannery to any kind. And we need to take measures to 
to channel the effluents that come out from these uh, industries and put them in proper place. Otherwise, they are going to pollute, like the way plastic is uh, all over our seas, uh, rivers, and water bodies. Similarly, all these chemicals and effluents will be contaminating our water bodies. Next. Now, sustainable development, millennium development goal, we talk about development. Now, who defines development? Are the people who are at the bottom, the lowly and the least, do they define? Do we define in universities? But basically, I think many of these uh, issues and the definitions and the parameters have come to us from the Western culture and civilization and institutions. So can we look at them again and, and have a critical look at it so that uh, we would like to have development of our own that would be able to sustain us. I always, as I was telling, I think a couple of times I have already mentioned, what happened to this, to that eight MDG, Millennium Development Goal? We don't talk about that. We didn't do well. India, if you see the, the report at the end, um, yes, successful uh, to some extent. But uh, the way we should have been successful, it was not because we are a large country, large population, even 0.1% matters. And therefore, if we see the result of those 15 years of 2000 to 2015, the eight millennium development goals, the, the end result was not very encouraging. Britain Wood institutions like IMF, World Bank have been established in 1944, 80 years back. But today, if we look around the world and in India, we'll see more poverty, more destitutions. So I do not know whether banks uh, help us to overcome this uh, poverty and destitution and make us sustainable. Uh, policies always come with ideologies. And therefore, institutions are built on ideologies and sustained or driven by ideologies. And uh, we need to look at those ideologies and see what could be the root causes of, of the kind of development that we are having. Always the question is that now I have said that 153 lakh crores that, that is our foreign debt. And anybody who is born at this moment in India is indebted to the banks. No? Who pays for it? We and the people who are at the bottom. Now, those are to be taken, you know, we must have a serious look at it. As I have said that education institutions, uh, we have more universities now. We have more IITs now than ever before. We have more IMs. Um, but uh, what sort of education are we giving? Uh, are we helping our children, our people to be more human? Uh, can they sustain themselves? Are, you, uh, are they having meaningful life? These are the questions that we need to discuss and, uh, and take steps to make our people, people's life more meaningful. Uh, everybody is a gift, and that gift is to be sustained, help, you know? And that's why I said, what are we teaching them in the schools and in the colleges and in the universities? Uh, I, I am in, in one of the biggest universities uh, in the country and in probably in Asia, huge. Uh, we have 143 departments. Uh, we have five institutions. We have 20 faculties, uh, large number of students, you know, uh, almost 70 uh, hostels for boys and girls. I al always think of as to when they go out, with what they go out. These are the questions that should be, should be asked. We should be asking ourselves and our uh, 
the people who administer these institutions uh, should also be putting these questions to themselves as well as to us. If you remember that United Nations uh, uh, you know, had a decade of education in the 90s, and uh, we have put in a lot of fund in it. We also got a lot of support from United Nations, but still almost uh, one fourth of our people are illiterate. 287 million out of 1.3 billion, is, it comes to that and they are illiterate. Next. Now, um, development communication uh, is a branch in communication and I'm from communication and uh, we have done uh, a little bit of studies in, in how development has out historically, who pushed it and how we are still carrying on. Uh, and it has always been development oriented. But the question, as I have put it, who defines what, what sort of development we should have and uh, who defines who communicates? You know, is it top down? Is it bottoms up? Or is it uh, the, the lateral way of communicating? Is it at the macro level or is it at the micro level? So, because communication is related to culture and that must be kept in mind. So the concept came from the USA and strongly supported by UN. And uh, it's a product of Cold War. It's a, and communication, development communication is a byproduct of propaganda history, propaganda strategies adopted by USA. There is no doubt about it. History will tell us. Started with Daniel Lerner, Wilbur Sham, and in the Philippines, we had a speaker. And I studied there in the University of the Philippines. Nora Cabral is known to us, uh, Everett Rogers. So they defined, they set parameters as to, and the way uh, they presented and we studied as if development communication would be the panacea for the underdevelopment uh, uh, sectors of the, of the society and underdeveloped countries of the world. It didn't happen that way. So there was a, a look, a relook at what development communication was doing. And then we came up with another concept or another definition called development support communication that went on again, supported by the United Nations for a long time. Then we moved to something called C4D in this century. And now we are talking with a lot of push from uh, United Nations, particularly UNICEF, saying that uh, it's communication for social and behavioral change. Now, uh, we all have some doubts and we need to look at it critically. Uh, behavior change came to the medicine education, medical education. And that was in 1970s, uh, 1980s in the social medicine department, they were thinking that they would be able to change the behavior using communication at that time. It didn't happen. The name of social medicine now in medical institutions, they call community medicine. Uh, again, uh, I think there are, there are possibility, there are campaigns that are going on for uh, behavioral change um, through communication and through many projects. Uh, how much of it uh, would be successful? We do not know. But so far, some areas, some successful, but uh, many failures. Uh, so we need to accept the failures and learn and move forward. One success story in India was that do boon jindagi, you know, polio drops. Uh, we are very proud because uh, we were able to eradicate with the help of many uh, multilateral organizations, international organizations, uh, Britain uh, banks, United Nations, but it, it took almost 22 years for us to eradicate polio from India. Dobun Jindagi was not a uh, open and shut case. Uh, there were 
course corrections several times, um, incorporating many of the new suggestions that came in. So, but the approach was uh, flexible, and that's how we were able to uh, succeed. So uh, I think when we take the context into consideration, where we are communicating, to whom we are communicating, and what is the culture, what is the context, if we take all these issues in, in our mind and put on our table, and then decide as to how to approach for development, I think we will be able to succeed like the way um, Dobun Jindagi or polio drops uh, became successful. It's not, uh, it was not easy. I'm sure those who have done it and there are studies, uh, they will say that uh, it was a daunting task, but then we went on plugging, it went on and we were able to do it. And again, I think with all that, we should be able to put MDG uh, foremost in our, in our path of development. Next. Now, what is to be done? All these uh, very negative kind of uh, issues that I, I have spoken, but we need to be, we are in university, so we need to be critical uh, because we are here to develop critical minds. Uh, what about these are to be cleaned up in India, wherever we can. And little uh, steps means it should start with us individually and at the community level. See, China has spent 10 billion to clean up Lake Tai, which is uh, near to Shanghai, which was very polluted. Uh, they spent 10 billion. They are now spending 330 billion to clean up all their water uh, bodies. Uh, water pollution is, is, is a big issue there. So they are spending that. And now we need to be a little careful individually so that we do not contaminate, we do not pollute our water with plastic, with many things that, that we are not so careful, throw things in the rivers. Um, water conservation and water harvesting should start at our level. If we are using five buckets of water a day, I think we should be able to cut half a bucket uh, individually, and then we'll be able to save water. Steps like that will have to be taken. You know? No to plastic will have to be done. I do not know why we are not doing, though there have been many attempts. Uh, planting of trees, as I was saying in the beginning itself, we are not even having 33% um, of the forest cover and tree cover. And in the Himalayas, we are falling short of required, much shorter than, than required. So uh, plant trees to celebrate birth, on the death anniversary, we must, all kinds of celebration, we should be able to plant trees, give gifts uh, as plant. Um, I remember in my younger days, uh, we used to give books as, uh, uh, as a gift on birthdays and even uh, when we were uh, invited to wedding, um, wedding uh, ceremonies. Um, that should be done. We can take a plant, small one, and, and give as gifts. Also, we should take planting as a, as a project in schools, in, in the villages, in, in colleges. It, there should be a celebration of planting trees at least for a, for a week, not only on 4th of June or 5th of June. Recycling of every kind should be done. And uh, nowadays, uh, we are walking less, and that's why we have lifestyle diseases. So we should walk more, ride less and do, do uh, a lot of cycling. And uh, human beings are the part of nature. We are not the owners. We must not lord over the, the nature. So what we need to do is to feel ourselves. If the planet is sustained, then we are sustained. If planet is taken care of, then we are taking care of ourselves. If planet is healed, then we will be able to heal ourselves. Otherwise, I think we are in a very slippery, dark slope. Next. So therefore, uh, suggestion is that we must relook at our curriculum. 
The things that we have not included, we need to include. We must analyze our context, analyze our society, analyze our environment, and then include many things that should be included in, in schools and uh, colleges' curriculum. I grew up in Calcutta in one of the schools, Bengali medium, and I remember that in class two, we were taught about health. There was a paper. In Bengali, we say Shasto. And I still remember that our teacher used to write something like when to cut your nails, you know? And one thing that was there that jekhane shekhane thutu felibena, do not spit around. I still remember that. I live in a city and I live in a campus where I find it difficult to have even one square meter where somebody has not spit it. So uh, if, we, if we want to uh, sustain, make, uh, tell our students to learn something, a thing or two, we need to get them when they are young and tell them what is to be done and what not to be done and why. We must give them the reasons. Local issues are to be paid attention to. Many times we are thinking about ozone layer, but we are not thinking about all the ponds and all the canals that we have polluted near our house. And therefore we are having all kinds of dengue and other things are coming in a big way. Also, I think we must enact laws, give the teeth to the, to the laws. If we have the laws, we need to modify them and practice those, implement those rigorously. The ecology will have to be created. Environment will have to be created. Uh, some people were speakers were talking about the awareness. I think that awareness should start from the individual, from the family, from schools at a very young age. Only then we will be conscious about, about the planet, about the earth, and we should be able to take care of it. And this should be part of our culture. We need to incorporate certain things in our culture. And culture is communication. Next. So uh, when we talk about communication, what comes to our mind is big media, the newspapers, the, uh, the television channels, radio stations, and so on and so forth. Um, I have lived all my life in communication, uh, learning communication, teaching communication and all. And I must say that uh, uh, many expectations that we had from media uh, have not happened. And uh, if you read the book of Herbert uh, Atschul, where he talks about the uh, media are the agents of power. Media would, big medias would always be, big media platforms are always with the powers that be in the society. Be it economical power, political power, they are there. And therefore, the ownership comes uh, with a big question mark. Who owns these platforms? And it will depend on what sort of tilt they are going to give to the news or whatever the content would be. Now, I, I, I should not belittle that. There have been many good things that have been done, but of late we can see that uh, media today in freedom of press in the world out of 180 countries, our rank is 142. That means we are not doing well as a democratic nation. The quality of democracy would depend on the freedom index or how free we are will determine the quality of democracy that we are having. And that is to be, and, and the current situation, 142 ranking, doesn't augur well for us. And therefore, what do we do? We must continue trying to use those platform, big platforms, but also we should be able to use little media, small media, because uh, they wouldn't require much economic power. 
and they would be controlled by individuals. And therefore, uh, what are those? There was a time when we were using Wall Magazine and all. Those are the platforms I think we need to use to make people aware of. Today, we have a wonderful instrument called internet uh, that and all kinds of social media we should be able to use. Tell our stories, tell our small little steps that we are taking to sustain the earth. Mouth to mouth, talk among ourselves, discuss things among ourselves. And little corners that are available to us in big medias, media, media platforms, we should be able to utilize those. Street play would be, would be something that we should be able to utilize. Because uppermost in our mind, and media should keep in their mind foremost is public good. Media exist because of public good. If they, if Tata is selling the steel, media industry would be selling newspapers, television programs. But there is a difference. Both are industries, but public good is not with the steel. Public good is with newspapers and media institution. So uppermost in our mind should be public good. And we should be driven only by that. And we must make a movement, you know, using small media, using social. There are many one minute films that you can see in YouTube. Our students make two minutes film, one minute film, even less than one minute films. And many times you are able to communicate much better uh, through those uh, small steps, through those efforts, individual or community efforts. No? So we should be able to be make people aware of through these steps. And we must begin at all level individually and practice it in our community, in our families, in our schools, in our classrooms. And we must create that kind of ecology that would become a vibrant culture um, for sustaining the earth. Because if the earth is not sustained, we will not be sustained. And in order to protect ourselves and to breathe freely, we must do all these uh, steps so that we are able to sustain the earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, presentation on little steps, which uh, as humanity, it begins at, charity begins at home. So we should learn ourselves. Uh, so we'd wait for some time to, for the uh, audience to type their uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, but uh, before that, I have a couple of questions to you, sir. Yes, please do so. Sir, uh, you are talking of India's foreign debt. So uh, is uh, India's foreign debt uh, obstacle towards uh, sustainable development? Do you think so? Um, definitely. Uh, it depends on, you know, you, are, you, you borrow in order to invest somewhere. No? so that it would it would help our people. Uh, I do not know uh, how much of the borrowed money have been put in those projects that are sustaining uh, our people. So, uh, and then we need to repay. There are uh, interests that we need to pay. So whatever we are earning in, the, in terms of uh, giving uh, interest, or uh, income, income tax that we collect uh, from the people, a part of it would go away to, to those uh, uh, banks from where we have borrowed. So otherwise we would have been in a position to use that money. Sir, one more question I have to you. Uh, sir, you are talking of floods and dams. And uh, what is your view? Uh, if we don't go for dams, uh, we are not going for uh, development of our nation. 
And uh, on the other hand, if you go for a development of the nation, we compromise with our environmental concerns. So uh, it is like uh, both sides of a coin. So uh, is there any way out to uh, say work towards a path of sustainable development? You were talking of MDGs, but uh, it seems that at present we all have we are all are towards the guidelines towards the Paris uh, Agreement, which is there, and we have almost forgotten what are the MDGs. We talk of SDGs, but hardly people know what are the uh, SDG goals. So how do we look forward? How do we go for education of the society towards this aspect so that we as a nation, we as academicians, we move forward. And also uh, it is the, it is the little step that we need to take. Uh, you have uh, raised the question of dams. Yeah, um, you see, uh, if you take uh, the question of uh, Mississippi River in, in the US dried up and uh, disaster has happened there because of big dams on Mississippi River. Similarly, in our own country, in, in the West, in our own country also, big dams have, uh, you know, would cause siltation of the, of the big rivers. Like I was giving you the example of Kishanganj, in Bihar, Bihar, eastern part of Bihar is every year it is flooded because of the siltation, no? because of the siltation of the uh, of the dam that we have built uh, there to divert water from Ganges to Bhagirathi, to Hooghly. So uh, I my uh, understanding is that the scientists should be able to help us out as to how to uh, you know harvest water for irrigation. But at the same time, do not kill the rivers. Do not allow the siltation to happen. Uh, so there will there are ways. Uh, human beings are endowed with a lot of uh, abilities. Uh, we we have a, a mind. I think if we want, we will be able to uh, solve the question of big dams. Maybe not big dams like like the way we have built in the past, but uh, small dams which would be sustainable and which would uh, meet our needs. Possibility is there, and, but we need to sustain uh, our, our rivers and our earth. Uh, otherwise, we don't exist. And about MDG and uh, um, sustainable development goal, uh, there are eight goals in MDG and there are 17. So altogether, we have 25 goals. I think we need to have workshops. Uh, we need to... Uh, have experts coming in from time to time to our schools and colleges and speak about them. And uh, and also maybe we can have uh, one credit or two credit courses uh, incorporated uh, in, in, in our curriculum. Say, for instance, now we know that uh, there are two credit courses in our university, and I'm sure it's around the university because this was um, uh, told by the UGC and we have incorporated two credit course on environmental studies. So why can't we have uh, one credit course on SDG and uh, MDG? So that, uh, you know, students are uh, aware of, you know, these are the issues that are facing uh, humanity. Definitely, sir. We would look forward to such courses on MDGs and agencies as to certain credit given to. If we don't give credit uh, to these courses, I think students and teachers will not get the enthu to start with this type of courses yes. in the universities and colleges. Even internships sir. can be can be done. Uh, I'm sure, uh, or uh, you know, uh, term and uh, papers can be written at the college and university level. Uh, assignments can be given on this, uh, you know, connecting it, like say, for instance, in communication, we can do uh, a lot of awareness if we give assignments to the, to the students of communication. Thank you, sir. Uh, the uh, participants are requested to type your uh, questions in the chat box. If you, uh, if you have certain questions to Professor Sishir Vashu, uh, please. I don't uh, see, I don't see any questions. So I think uh, everyone has understood agreed everything. with me or haven't uh, haven't agreed so they do not want to get into a controversy probably <laughs> <laughs> so they have fully agreed with you sir but mm -hmm. then i have one question sir yeah so sir what do you think what is the best way of uh, communication for 
uh, showcasing our Indian culture? Um, showcasing our Indian culture, I think uh, uh, we, are, we are multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic society. All of us, uh, we have our own uh, uh, little environment where we, we grow. Uh, what what needs to be done is to is to have a kind of positive attitude towards our culture of our own individual culture as well as the culture of others so that we can learn from them and they can learn from us so uh, the world is uh, interdependent we and uh, for sustainability we need to depend on on each other long time back uh, buddha was saying that the whole world and the outer world and the universe, and there are multi-universe 2,500 years back. Uh, he said, pratitya uh, samutpad, means interdependent. And that uh, is the key today. We need to depend on each other and uh, sustain each other. So one last, last question from my side, sir. So this is really interesting talking to you on communication and little steps, which uh, is very interesting. So, sir, uh, you are talking of public good. Should we leave public good to the government? Or as an educated society, so what is public good for us? Certainly and what not. is public good as an Certainly academic? not. Who is government? Government is our reflection. Isn't it? They are not Definitely. coming from another planet. They are from our society only. They belong to us. We choose the individuals and ask them to form the government and govern us. So uh, it is dependent on all of us. That awareness, that creation of ecology uh, will have to come. Cultural ecology that would sustain uh, the development. So public good should come. What is good for the public should be done. What is not good for the public should not be done. And this is particularly for media. No? Media exist because of the public good. They are there, they are informing us because they are making us aware about our problems, our, our things to celebrate, issues to celebrate. And therefore, whatever is good for public should be put forward, should be uh, given to the readers, to the viewers, and all. So, not one-sided, you know, news. Not one-sided views. You know? They will have to critically tell us as to what is to be taken and what is to be uh, taken forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for a uh, presentation, such a vivid presentation, and uh, which everyone. Uh, give certain uh, it's thought provocating we can say sir thank you sir thank you uh, for this wonderful presentation and with this we conclude session four and uh, we thank you from our heart from towards coming and joining us taking out your valuable time uh, thank you sir thank you thank you very much thank you sir we now commence a session five uh, we have uh, Professor Deepak Kumar Bhera, who has already joined us. So at the onset, uh, I would like to uh, introduce Professor Deepak Kumar Bhera, who is a Vice Chancellor, Kalinda Institute of Social Studies, Orissa, India. Professor Deepak Kumar Bhera, an internationally acclaimed anthropologist, has taken charge as the Vice Chancellor of the Kalinga Institute of Social Studies prior to joining Kalinga Institute. He has served as the Vice Chancellor of Sambalpur University, Bairampur University, and Rajendra University, Balangir. Professor Behera has the distinction of being the only anthropologist in India to become the Vice Chancellor of three different universities. Professor Behera was a Fulbright visiting professor at California State University, Long Beach, USA. He was also a dad visiting guest professor, University of Tuvenbing, Germany. He, he was an Indo-French Academic Exchange Fellow, ICSSR, New Delhi, Indo-Israel Culture and Educational Exchange Fellow, UGC, New Delhi. He was the recipient of the prestigious Sarath Chandra Roy Memorial Gold Medal for his outstanding contribution in the field of social anthropology in India. 
by the Asiatic Society Kolkata in the year 2016. Professor Beara is the General President, United Indian Anthropology Forum. He is the series editor of Contemporary Society Tribal Studies. He has visited more than 30 countries in different academic connections. Professor Beara has published 21 books, edited volumes, and has authored 123 research articles published in reputed journals. He has successfully guided 26 PhD scholars. So we'll deliver it on the topic, sustainable tribal development in India, issues and challenges, requesting sir for his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Das, am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay. So good afternoon and uh, greetings from Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences. Um, it's sciences, madam, not uh, studies. And um, so my institution name is Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, it's a deemed to be university falling under the de novo category. And uh, when I say greetings from Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences, right now I am in IIT Guwahati attending uh, a conclave there. And uh, so I just uh, finished uh, um, a round table there and I'm rushing to make this presentation. So I initially thought of sharing screen to show a PowerPoint. I'm not sure whether I can do that, but uh, you know, um, Sustainable, when you say sustainable tribal development in India, issues and challenges, there are many challenges. So there is a saying, you know, development uh, takes place at the cost of uh, underdevelopment. If you want to develop uh, Delhi, maybe you perpetuate backwardness in a state like Odisha. And you, if you want to develop uh, the capital city of Odisha, like Bhubaneswar, then perpetuate backwardness in a region like KBK, Kalahandi, Balangir, and uh, the other K is Koraput. The point what I'm trying to make is that uh, when it is uh, development, you know, someone has to make a sacrifice on the altar of development. And most often, you know, uh, it is uh, the marginalized people, uh, the, you know, people who are uh, economically exploited, uh, socially suppressed and culturally oppressed. So they are called upon to make the sacrifice on the altar of development. So when we talk about uh, development, you know, um, uh, it is seen that, uh, you know, most development efforts in the tribal area have not produced uh, the desired result. Many times uh, such schemes turn out to be fragmentary and at times even cross-purposive. During past several decades, we have been changing our approaches to tribal development. And initially we began with uh, you know growth of income approach uh, with heavy emphasis on economic aspect, then uh, the need for rising per capita, income and injection of outside uh, investment technology and know-how. But later on, you know, the policymaker and planner started realizing development is far more complex uh, than increasing in per capita income. And then they thought of institutional approach uh, like uh, for tribal development. And institution uh, became the point of reference Varieties of variables uh, measuring health, uh, education, sanitary condition, calorie intake, uh, protein consumption, etc., were added. And uh, there was, uh, they had a belief that the individual in need of uh, a particular service had to move to the like block, hospital, school. These are like institutions. But <clears throat> institutions were uh, you know, criticism, uh, like often measured by their size and style, rather than the quality of personal working in them and the quality of services they provided to the people. People living far away from an institution would profit very little from it. And that is how development became spotty and began to generate center of development on the one end and vast track of untouched terrain on the other. So 
Then again, uh, they thought that, okay, first approach, growth of income approach is not good and institutional approach is not good. And then they started following a new approach like liberation approach. Development could start only from the below. It was believed and what's like grassroots, barefoot became popular. Tribal people at the grassroots became the point of reference. And attempts were made for the liberation of uh, the tribal people uh, from the bondage of debts and slavery in order to make them uh, self-sufficient. And the human aspect for the first time took precedence over the economic and technological aspect. Even then, that uh, liberation approach failed. And it was criticism, uh, I would say, that planning was still not done and was done by the policymaker and programmer, not by the, you know, people uh, from the grassroots. People didn't get enough chance to participate in those kind of activities. Then they talk of, uh, you know, so they wanted to replace uh, this liberalism approach by integration approach. And attempts were made to ensure greater flow of benefits from haves to have nots. And the idea was to integrate tribal people into the mainstream civilization and development of tribe was viewed from the angle of policymaker, planner, and implementers. Even at this stage, you know, um, the uh, people uh, representing the grassroots, uh, the tribal people were not given enough opportunity to participate in decision making. So I am reminded of 1950s when there was a you know fight between two. Uh, uh, important scholar, uh, Verrier Elwin, uh, he was uh, an anthropologist and Professor G.S. Gure, a sociologist. Uh, Verrier Elwin suggested the creation of national park and he advocated about isolation policy where tribal people could live safely without being victims, you know, uh, because he advocated that the policy of isolation and in contrast to that, Professor G.S. Gure, you know, advocated or he favored assimilation. According to G.S. Gure, the tribal are backward Hindus and they should be completely assimilated to Hindu culture. But, uh, you know, this debate uh, continued and, uh, you know, uh, in uh, social science circuit, you know, they're treated like uh, Karl Marx and uh, Max Weber. But uh, then Dean Majundar pitched in and uh, he, started floating a new idea, the philosophy of integration. He said that it is not possible to leave them to their own. It is not possible to completely assimilate them in the Hindu culture. Therefore, a gradual integration of the tribal people is the best policy. Like the, you know, it is like the salad bowl theory where, uh, you know, each ingredient maintains its distinct identity. But when you take salad, eat salad, it gives you this taste of salad, not the taste of like onion or uh, tomato or, uh, you know, cucumber. It gives you the taste of salad like that, uh, you know, tribal culture will have their distinct identity, but they will also benefit from the fruits of development. And, uh, you know, we keep on changing policy. It's very important to realize that uh, Different tribal communities are at different level of socioeconomic development. You cannot club them together. For instance, we have uh, Bonda, I mean, Mina tribes of Rajasthan, and um, maximum number of uh, civil servant, you know, uh, you will find from that community, many of them are highest officer and they are holding many important position uh, in government jobs. And uh, then that is at one end, and you take the Bondas of my state, you know, um, Odisha, uh, they live in, you know, the Bondar Highlands and uh, very, they are uh, uh, economically backward. I will never say culturally backward. So how can you have uh, the same policy program package for uh, tribes so at a varying level of uh, socioeconomic development? See, that is why during 1975, the subplan approach was introduced. And uh, in the subplan approach, uh, you know, the state which had 50% of the tribal population uh, were, uh, you know, 
included in this uh, program and uh, and then uh, that is how they were given different treatment like uh, meso micro and then uh, areas uh, where uh, you know they are living uh, amidst uh, the non tribal people so they are treated separately i am i am you know uh, reminded of uh, nehru panchasil jawaharlal nehru you know the the past prime minister of india formulated five principle uh, for the uh, you know for tribal development although he was not an anthropologist but uh, i admire his idea so he said people should develop along the line of their own genius and the imposition of alien values should be avoided and second one tribal rights in land and forest should be respected third team of tribal should be trained in the work of administration and development people like you and me should not go there to administer tribal region so uh, tribal administrator are the best people to uh, do the tribal administration uh, in areas dominated by tribe the fourth principle that uh, he suggested tribal areas should not be over administered or overwhelmed with the multiplicity of scheme so sometime we confuse them with many scheme and those areas should not be over administered and finally he said results should be judged not by statistics or the amount of money spent but by the human character that is evolved or the quality of services provided by those scheme or institution so that is uh, nehru's you know panchasil uh, niti and uh, um and when we talk about sustainable travel development you know sustainability development which uh, meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs that is very very important and uh, you know in economics we say that the economy is uh, the uh, infrastructure upon which the superstructure should based upon but for an anthropologist for a person like me culture is the infrastructure upon which the superstructure should be based upon and there also i put economy on the superstructure but i put culture in the infrastructure because uh, development should be viewed from economical uh, sorry cultural perspective and um, uh, sustainable development is likely to achieve lasting satisfaction of human needs and improvement in the quality of human life it's not like uh, you know per capita growth in per capita income and sustainable development suggests that lesson from ecology can and should be applied to economic process and uh, sustainable society is that one that lives uh, within itself perpetuating limits of its environment so it helps the indigenous poor uh, because they are left with no option other than destroying the nature sometime we accuse them as a, a destroyer of uh, natural resources but uh, because of uh, poverty because of other cultural i mean constraint they destroy nature so because when you destabilize three things like jal jungle zameen and uh, then uh, that uh, destabilize their economic system and that is why they had no other they, they get no other option than destroying resources uh, and this cost benefit analysis has to be made many times you know when we discuss about macro project it is said that you know this macro project uh, will give us this kind of benefit and uh, the cost is very less and um, projection is made at the macro level but in social anthropology we say that uh, you know this assessment should be made at the micro level if i have sacrificed something for a mega dam or mega project uh, then uh, what kind of benefit i am going to accrue from this said mega project if i am not getting anything and if someone is getting or uh, reaping the benefit then it is unjust cost benefit analysis it is not just cost benefit analysis so it should be people centered 
and it should be you know uh, development should be people centered it should be cost effective and self reliant these are important and uh, whenever you think about a sustainable tribal development you must understand their you know social organization and cultural values many times we fail to locate the intangible cultural heritage of tribal people and you know in uh, tribal community we find some uh, cultural regulators those regulators are very important for uh, maintaining the sustainability and as outsider when we go we fail to see those cultural regulators and uh, we go there with our best intention but we destabilize the cultural regulators and it, it creates a boomerang effect and uh, the community suffer maybe if time permits i will give you some example and the as i said you know the quality of life uh, here i am reminded of uh, raulkla steel plant i would cite example from odisha you know you go there you know there are three resettlement colony jaldhi uh, jagda and chirpani in all the three settlement if you go there you will see non tribal people those settlements uh, patch of lands were given to those people who sacrifice their land for the construction of raulkla steel plant but now uh, you, you'll find uh, there are uh, no tribal people they have already disposed of that land and uh, you will not find the breeding of drum so and uh, that also created a kind of cleavage because uh, the younger generation at the time of the establishment uh, of raul class steel plant they uh, thought of living very close to the plant so that uh, the government decided to give uh, a job to one person in the family and the older generation move out to reclaim land at uh, far off places like 50 km 60 km so it created a kind of family background uh, family disorganization because within the family uh, you know there was a kind of cleavage younger generation stayed close to the plant and the older generation move away far away and then uh, you know the younger generation again dispose of that 14 to 60 square Bit of land which they got as a uh, uh, you know matter of compensation, and similarly you know, you know we should also uh, strike out a balance between national and uh, uh, state uh, uh, level uh, development because sometimes local interests are sacrificed. I am reminded of another project, uh, Kiraku Dam project. Uh, so the Kulta was the local population. Kulta are not tribal, but uh, they are the local you know peasant and i would like to say this when uh, you know raulkla uh, sorry when kiraku dam was constructed a kind of uh, rumor got floated that when electricity is produced out of water it is no more conducive for irrigation purpose they simply i mean simple and gullible kulta believed that version and that is why they uh, didn't come forward to accept uh, the 100% subsidy given by the then government so biju patnaik uh, was the chief minister of odisha then he requested uh, chinna reddy from andhra pradesh so so andhra pradesh he, he sent some uh, uh, farmers from east and west godavari they claimed and uh, you know they came and uh, they cleared uh, uh, different patches of land and uh, then they by disposing one acre of land in andhra pradesh they could buy 40 acres of land here in you know uh, the command area of uh, the hirakud dam and that is how land come into came into market and it got fizzled out from the hands of uh, the local uh, population to the you know uh, farmers from east and west godavari come command kapu kas the point what i'm trying to say is that they are in fact the messenger of god they brought the high yielding variety of seed the mechanized farming double cropping but what happened to the local people so this also should be thought up and uh, you know what is very important uh, certain human factors should also be taken into consideration when you are thinking about any sustainable development so are they aware of your project when you are talking about a development project and uh, if they are aware what kind of perception do they have and uh, if their perception is wrong 
do you think that they will feel motivated to come forward to participate if they have a wrong perception you have to change the perception and make the wrong perception as a right one and when they have the right kind of perception they will feel motivated and come forward to participate so normally what happens in a you know in present day system we plan everything the policy maker uh, planner uh, you know uh, and uh, the developmental agents they plan everything sitting in a uh, you know uh, air conditioner uh, four walls of a room and then they try to implement it uh, that is the point where they go wrong and wrong seriously they never you know try to involve the local population at the level of formulating a project uh, that is very very important if you involve them you know while formulating a project then definitely they will come forward to participate but if you invite them to participate at the last minute they will raise their bro thinking that it's a government project and uh, they will not uh, feel sufficiently motivated so all these human factors should also be analyzed when you are thinking of sustainable development and uh, you know it is very important also to you know understand uh, their uh, you know i said the intangible cultural heritage uh, for instance uh, uh, you know i would like to cite you one uh, my my field experiences in anthropology we take our student to the field and we stay there for long one month and uh, and it is a camp based field work and uh, uh, and it's very rigorous kind of field work and i have interacted with many tribal people and i have seen them from a close quarter so i would like to share some of my experiences field experiences uh, how you know this cultural regulators are very important how intangible culture is very important i am reminded of a person i was passing through a, a rice field and uh, and i saw a tall tree and a man uh, you know he was uh, moving around a tree um, and blowing whistle and speaking to uh, looking to the top of the tree and speaking to you know in a very a lion language and uh, you know he was also beating his chest for a time i mistook him as a mad person you know in anthropology we have been trained not to disturb the natural setting i didn't say anything but suddenly he noticed me and he was very unhappy and he came towards me said what are you doing and before i you know i was about to ask the same question i said no no i was just watching so then he was on a piece said that's none of your business and could you give me a pack of cigarette i said i am a non smoker and said when you go back i said when we go back to the village i would get you a pack of uh, local cigarette bd and then the man said could you see the tall trees i said yes and could you see the dried leaves and uh, you know like uh, twigs uh, stem fallen around the tree and uh, i am going to set fire and uh, i was speaking to my ancestor you know they are all old people they live on the top of the tree i was requesting them to leave this area for a wild tree and because i am going to set fire to this uh, um, you know leaves twigs fallen around the tree dried branches and i was speaking to them uh, in my own language because they are deaf and dumb or very old people so that's why i was beating my chest and communicating them in my own language you know it came to me as a big surprise being a trained anthropologist uh, i got deceived i mistook him as a mad person look at this scene you know uh, that is uh, intangible cultural heritage and that is very sad and he said to me then see nothing happens without their blessing so we cannot progress in our life without their blessing so that is why it is very important for our part to pay them respect and i am reminded of another story you know in anthropology storytelling is very very important i would like to narrate another story so this is a, a relating to i was in a field in a very remote area and we are doing our field work among uh, this uh, uh um, i am i am forgetting the name of the tribe hill khadia uh, you know sorry pulling hill bhuya pahadi paudi bhuya and uh, then uh, uh, the doctor who happens to 
my younger sister classmate one day he came said dada dada means elder brother i heard that you are here so i have come to meet and i am in serious problem and uh, then i said what is your problem these uh, powdy bhaiya people are very and uh, he used filthy language savages barbaric and they don't uh, understand what uh, is my problem and they are not accepting family planning then i said uh, so and uh, see the cdmo would come and uh, the uh, 31st march is fast approaching and i am well set up the target then i engaged a couple of my female scholar they went and interacted with this uh, women powdy bhaiya women and they gave a very you know interesting explanation they said that see a child comes to the earth by natural means and the child should not be prevented from coming to earth by any unnatural means and family planning is an unnatural means and that is why and uh, i cannot go undergo that kind of oppression and if uh, it will come to the notice of uh, uh, our community member they would not accept water from my hand and there would be social boycott kukka pani ban that is what uh, she said, narrated to my researcher she and this poor doctor i, I shouldn't say poor doctor bit because uh, he happened to be the classmate of my sister and he was shouting target target and uh, using filthy language to you know uh, describe them and so this is our poor understanding uh, you know because we are not part and parcel of for the system we fail to understand because we are all intruders for instance you go to koraput if i can't speak desia language i am an intruder those people who speak desia language they are desia and uh, others are intruder like they also call them some parja in relation to raja so there are also social categories you know many times we think about this administrative category scheduled caste scheduled tribe obc scbc these are all administrative category but it is important to know how a indigenous person or a tribal person would relate himself with other community members in and around that locality so he would relate them with legend myth and uh, you know and folk tale oral epics these are very important you know that is you know how you identify others and how you you know how you are being identified by others and how you identify yourself here the tribal people they identify themselves in a particular manner but we never give importance to that okay these administrative categories are very very important but at the same time social category are also very important and we should not underestimate uh, this social uh, category and uh, many times you know we think of uh, you know uh, orthogenetic uh, heterogenetic development i have seen you know in tribal areas of koraput uh, they have introduced coffee plantation and other forms of uh, heterogenetic development development which comes from outside but uh, in anthropology you know we do uh, this human resource mapping then material resource mapping and cultural resource mapping there are standard techniques for doing that and i am trained in all the three how you will do a human resource mapping because i would again give one example for instance uh, this mankedia uh, they you know the trap monkey and the monkey meat is a delicacy in the community and they are very good rope maker and they are also known as chanchus in andhra pradesh and other uh, in other parts of india they, you know but they are same and then they are semi nomadic and they prepare coarse variety of rope uh, from the bark of a tree and a plant by the name murga and uh, you know if you go to radakol region you will find this uh, plant murga plant in plenty and also the tree from where they prepare uh, the, the bark is used for the preparation manufacturing of uh, the coarse variety of uh, rope now that is uh, you know that is uh, the human resource is there they are very good rope maker the material resource is available in that locality because uh, this murga plant and the tree which bark is used for preparation of uh, the rope is also there 
and the traditional institution like that is their traditional occupation so the cultural uh, resource is also there so why not we encourage them for rope making you know and why not we help them in uh, you know um, repairing or manufacturing refined variety of rope and uh, why don't you help them in the forward backward linkage and create uh, you know indigenous entrepreneurship in that locality instead of doing that we try to promote coffee cultivation in that area this is very strange thing uh, we do because of our poor understanding about the social organization of the community and uh, you know sometime uh, uh, you should do the need assessment and then uh, you have to do the prioritization of the needs instead of doing that uh, need assessment and prioritization of need will you know launch a project on aids this this is not at all a problem in tribal community aids is not a problem you know aids is a problem of uh, the so called civilized people like us and, uh, and they are very healthy people and uh, and uh, but uh, we because we have got a project it is not their priority their priority may be drinking water their priority may be health but because we have got a project on uh, aids and we sensitize them on aids and uh, you know we do all kind of donkey things there see that is why people should be involved at the level of formulating a project and uh, sometime you know even uh, when we give compensation in a mega project you know my previous speaker uh, i enjoyed listening to him and uh, he was uh, de delivering a very nice lecture and he spoke about also dam project and uh, you know when compensation is given and compensation is given to you know like land for land and many of these people don't have patta you know so that uh, uh, if they don't have patta but that is like their customary right they have been tilling that land for centuries their poor father poor poor fathers have been tilling that land and that is they feel that this is my land and suddenly you say that you don't have a patta so we cannot give you compensation she this is very unfair treatment uh, because uh, they don't have the patta and uh, suddenly and you say that you can't cut the tree and uh, you have to take permission and they would be treated as trespasser in their own land how can you do that they have been living there you know they, they initially they were thinking like uh, forest as an extension of themselves and now they have developed uh, a different kind of dependency you know previously it was constructive dependence as described by walter fernandez now that constructive dependence has been replaced by destructive dependence because they feel that is the property of uh, the government so sarkar ki mal darya mein dal so let me exploit as much as i can because now they have changed their attitude now we have to take them into confidence and uh, your uh, you know uh, and uh, they should not be treated as uh, like objects of development they should be treated of uh, subject of uh, development and when i say subject means uh, both the partners should be of equal strain and uh, many times we play the role of uh, you know big brother we never try to develop leadership i mean qualities within the community so we can't stay there for long we have to leave the field at one point of time if we are not creating leadership if we are not shifting the responsibility to the local people your project is bound to fail and fail miserably nothing more nothing less this is my conviction and i have seen tribal life from a close quarter and this is my self realization and uh, i can say you for sure and uh, many times you know you also see uh, the indigenous knowledge and they have wonderful knowledge but we never give recognition to their indigenous knowledge and uh, again i would uh, like to share uh, some of the wonderful knowledge they have but uh, you know, like i am reminded once who we are in a field and uh, i was with my student we are going to a you know waterfall and i said uh, a shepherd boy why don't you lead us uh, help us to reach that place he said no no sir i can't go it's going to rain it was a bright sky and uh, we saw the sun and uh, then i said probably he is cutting 
excuse and uh, he is not interested uh, we are not happy and i uh, said please don't go and it's going to rain we didn't believe and we moved on and on after 5 minutes it started raining and raining and you know we started realizing you know see the local knowledge this no local knowledge is never given recognition we many times think of patent and uh, you know like registration but we we do the patenting but we never send it back to the community in the form of uh, you know uh, technical knowledge you know indigenous knowledge when it is uh, recorded black and white we call it indigenous knowledge system indigenous knowledge means uh, the participants uh, you know way of uh, seeing a particular thing if i am from a tribal tribal community and the way i look at a thing that is uh, like indigenous knowledge but when i go there as a social scientist uh, or a scholar and if i try to document that that is indigenous knowledge system and uh, if i develop that and uh, you know give it back to the community in the form of technology that is indigenous technical knowledge we do that but we said that this is my patent we keep on arguing but uh, we you know relegate the people to the background i am reminded of uh, you know a couple of uh, uh, bengal poraja people from uh, uh, you know koraput district one said is so how can uh, the land be taken over by the government you know the land belongs to our god and uh, we must live close to our god if the land will go down under water we are ready to you know sacrifice our lives see the voices you know because he spoke from his heart and he was very unhappy and the other respondent said you know i see water all around i sacrifice my land and i see also lights uh, you know and uh, but i failed to bring you know water to my land i sacrifice so much for the dam but i got nothing in return so if the rich farmer in kalahandi will harvest the benefit and the poor penga in kalahandi or koraput will make the sacrifice is it development you know that uh, that is need, that needs to be answered and uh, when one area would be declared as a you know for a dam project or so then there will be no development work so if uh, the development work uh, will start after 10 years 15 years in case of upper indravati it uh, you know after three decades the process began so for three decades they didn't see any development pro- project and then there are cons- you know constructed roads and uh, then they said that sir we don't need roads why don't you develop our footpaths i said why because you know we don't have money to travel by bus and we when we go to market you know i stay at one place i meet my relatives there and i, I take rest and then move to the market and i keep my network uh, social network you know strong but uh, we never realize that uh, you know we think that you know constructing road is uh, development and uh, believe me you know case of aparandravati that is like the road of resource drain because four wheelers will go that way and uh, drain out all the resources from the locality so the road which you think that uh, is a you know parameter of uh, your development that road will be used by the non tribals for draining out resources from that reason and they said that we need pedestrian because uh, we need uh, you know better variety of bicycle but we never think in that line what is uh, they are thinking you know we try to our approach is like bottom top approach uh, sorry top bottom approach we never think about and i am reminded of the education you know so uh, this education uh, i must tell you uh, in uh, uh, you know many uh, tribal uh, student they said sir why don't you introduce uh, sir archery and agriculture uh, in our uh, course curriculum we are interested in that and why will Read, read about uh, the non-tribal hero. You should keep a course on Birsa Munda and other other tribal leaders. And uh, see, I come from a Balinga Institute of Social Science. I must uh, speak something about my institute. Otherwise, that will be great insti- injustice. And where I am using my anthropological knowledge uh, for uh, the development uh, 
of the tribal people and uh, tribal student. And uh, you see, you know, it is very important to, you know, provide them uh, uh, this uh, entrepreneurship uh, kind of exposure. Now we have come out with a project like Atman Irversil Janajati Yuba Udyami. See, every, every pass out cannot be provided with a job. Therefore, it is very, very important to think about alternatives. So that is why they are our brand ambassador. They are our researcher. Those research color, we are asking that to go to your area and do a resource mapping, natural, sorry, this human resource, then material resource and cultural resource. And then uh, they come out with uh, ideas and we have like a indigenous innovation incubator. And we try to capture their idea and we try to pitch uh, in the form of uh, entrepreneurship uh, program. And we have our tie up with many. Uh, uh, for today, for instance, uh, I'm attending a Janjati Gorab Dibas and I spoke about also my idea. I shared my idea here at IIT Guwahati and I'm doing two things simultaneously. I don't know whether it is successfully or unsuccessfully. So, um, you know, uh, and, and, and you see the point, and again, we have engaged professor of practice, so Professor Osak Mahapatra is there. He was, for quite some time, he was here in uh, Kiss University. This professor of practice is a man uh, with, uh, without any formal education. He is a, uh, almost like an unlettered person but he's an Adivasi from remote areas. And uh, he would come and teach our student in open air, like uh, the Dhamsa dance, then Sora painting, then traditional healing, and then different forms of you know, language learning. And this, this uh, we have 14 professor of practice. I call them the you know, traditional intellectual. And the other end, we have also 23 professor of emeritus, professor emeriti in plural, uh, the like means uh, those who are, you know, eminent personality in education. So they are like the modern intellectual and the traditional intellectual. The modern intellectual teach our student in the classroom. The traditional intellectual come and teach our student in the open air. So that, like that, you know, like we have also, you know, formed now a tribal advisory council. I am not also a member of tribal advisory council. All the 21 are from tribal background, Adivasi background. So they take, uh, make suggestion and the board of management accept uh, all the suggestion. And we have also a working committee for the preservation, promotion and protection of tribal cultural heritage and diversity. So it is important that, you know, we have also formed language club. Recently, KIS own the, you know, UNESCO International Literacy Prize for Multi- mother tongue based multilingual education and we are also trying to de develop the keyboard for ho uh, that the language is like oranchiti and kuvi uh, we uh, you know recently we invited uh, uh, the linguist and also the technical people from uh, it department computer science department and uh, we are developing one project with the help of lenovo and motorola the Kuvi character set. And the other one, like the whole language, we are uh, with, uh, with the National uh, Rashtriya Bhasa Samiti. We are trying to develop and uh, where, uh, you know, uh, language is very important uh, factor. And uh, you are that I'm sure in this, you know, meeting, there must be many linguists and uh, we need them. And if please visit our institution, we provide them 30,000 students, free education, free lodge and board and uh, free health care. And uh, we also try to capture their idea. And uh, we try to maintain, uh, and now we are also celebrating their festival. And uh, we have developed a calendar where students will be given holidays during the busy time in their family, like Dhankata Chuti we have introduced. So we are experimenting and uh, I'm a small person and because uh, I'm trying to use my anthropological knowledge for uh, this reason and uh, uh, whatever little bit of experience and exposure I have uh, because uh, I have been researching on tribal study for past three decades and I would request everyone to 
uh, read out uh, the 10 volumes I have brought out with a German professor. Uh, his name um, is uh, Professor Georg Pfeffer. He is no more. Uh, late pro uh, pro uh, Georg Professor from Free University of Berlin, where you will find overseas perspective on tribal India and also 30-40 percent contributors to those 10 volumes uh, are from uh, outside India and uh, um, like 60 percent from India. And um, we have also one uh, uh, volume with the concept of uh, tribe there and you know and tribal society. And uh, please visit our website like university.kis.se.in to know more about our innovation. KIS is an, has now become a uh, center of innovation or a university of innovation. And we try to do that, but uh, I don't say that we have achieved a great deal. We are still uh, raw, novice, green, and uh, we are trying seriously to bring certain uh, changes uh, in the lives uh, uh, of the people say culture and language are very very important that uh, those two factors give identity to a person so how uh, important are language and culture that uh, we understand uh, especially i understand as an anthropologist and i am trying to ensure that uh, you know we have language club where children speak to each other uh, in their own language and uh, these are some of uh, the things that I wanted to share with you. And I think my time is also over because uh, uh, Dr. Das has uh, already appeared on the screen. That gives good indication that my time is over. But I would uh, be very happy to interact uh, with the participant. And uh, uh, hopefully, you know, I, am, I was very nervous and tense because uh, I'm sitting from a very clumsy place uh, in a crowded place and uh, I'm speaking from Guwahati, IIT Guwahati. Thank you very much. Namaskar. And if you have any question, I would be happy to answer. Thank you, sir, for such a sensitizing uh, deliberation. And uh, we hope all our attendees, participants and panelists are enlightened with your viewpoints on tribal development and uh, certainly inviting all the attendees, participants, and panelists to put forward your question to Sir. Uh, you can uh, write your questions in the chat box. But before that, uh, Sir, I have one question to you. Sir, uh, really? sir you were talking of uh, uh, Jal, Jamin, and Jungle. So how do we stabilize this struggle for Jal, Jamin, and Jungle? Yeah, I mean, uh, they are uh, a tribal economy revolves around Jal, Jangil, and Jameen. So whenever, you know, any mega project, uh, uh, you know, destabilize Jal, Jangal, Jameen, tribal people uh, would definitely suffer. So because uh, that is their bread and butter. And, um, you know, you see, I'm reminded of, a, again, a you know, field situation. They, they said that we, you know, it's like a tapu village, you know, like an airline. And uh, this, you know, some of the displaced people, they said that, you know, they, they wanted to ship them to the rehabilitation colony. They said, no, 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 we'll not go there. Because here we are very close to jungle. And from jungle, we get all our resources. And what would happen to our, uh, you know, uh, cattle and animal because when we go to the resettlement colony there is no grazing field so when we think of uh, this uh, you know rehabilitation colony we never take into account the cultural uh, you know scenario that cultural replication has to be made in the resettlement colony they said that sir what about our deities where can we you know how can we worship the gramsari so this jal jungle jameen you know, this is very, very, for instance, uh, within two hills, you will find the valley. And uh, when, uh, in case of Upper Andravati, the whole valley got inundated. And then that also destabilized their social ties. For example, Meres Circle, you know, then they said that when we go to establish a matrimonial alliance with the other village, we have to pay 20 rupees 
for crossing that to, to, to reaching that place and coming back so how you know there are far reaching consequences uh, you know one is like uh, uh, unintended consequences i would say many times we go for developmental project i, I would like to be top the record but i would say one thing how sometime we go there with our best intention it destabilize the you know uh, cultural regulator i am here i am reminded of one project by the government of odisha they introduced the 1 rupee kilo 1 uh, rupee ki, you know kilo rice and uh, what happened that particular year tribal people get 20 kilo rice and what uh, instead of uh, and uh, they eat mango kernel during uh, the lean season because during lean season this 20 kilo rice uh, they got and they started consuming the rice without processing the mango kernel they had a festival like takuhana parav this takuhana parav after that they can process the mango kernel they take out the white portion of the mango kernel and they grind it and they tie it in a thin piece of cloth they will put it under running water so that the bitterness will go then they bring it and dry it under sun and then put it in a pitcher earthen pitcher put some uh, dry chili to on the top of that tea and they will tie a thin piece of cloth on the mouth of the pitch uh, this earthen pot and they put it upside down and when there is a food crisis they take out uh, the powder add some water to that and uh, the from the gruel they prepare pancake and that is how they eat and they manage the food crisis but what happened in that particular year because of the supply they didn't process the mango kernel and the mango kernel you know then fungus got infected and by eating this fungus infected mango kernel many people died there was a hue and cry in the assembly that people are dying by eating mango kernel they have been eating mango kernel for centuries people didn't die by eating mango kernel here you know government came with a very good intention of helping them during the lean season when there is a shortage of food but that destabilized the cultural regulator because they didn't process the mango in time soon after the takwana spora they kept the mango inside you know in a dark room uh, under the cut and that is how the mango got infected by you know fungus and by eating fungus infected mango kernel they died so see the cultural explanation so you you try to do intervention but your intervention creates a kind of boomerang effect so the jal jungle zameen we should be very careful and we should not destabilize jal jungle zameen thank you sir thank you so much for such a sensitizing uh, lecture or deliberations to us and uh, certainly taking out time from your conference and coming to us at sanjeevas university kolkata for delivering Uh, or for this particular address on tribal development so thank you so much uh, from sanjeevas university kolkata thank you sir namaskar we conclude session 5 now we come in session 6 uh, we now move on to our last speaker for the day reverend dr a arukaswamy professor of mathematics sanjeevas university kolkata Dr Arupa Swami is a Jesuit priest from Madurai province he is a present professor in mathematics at St Xavier University Kolkata being a gold medalist in mathematics from Loyola College Chennai he has done his phd in pure mathematics under the title fixed point theorems and was awarded uh, by ms Un- university trinavelli He has published his thesis through various articles in international reputed journals. He has attended many national international conferences and presented papers. He has been teaching mathematics and holding administrative responsibilities for the first 20 years in various esteemed Jesuit institutions of higher education both in South and Northeast India. He has also done the licentiate in uh, Sacred Scripture Pontifical Biblical Institute Rome. He has been the visiting faculty for scripture in various theologue the topic for his presentation is democracy empowerment of higher education towards sustainable development of west bengal requesting dr a or goswami for his presentation over to you sir thank you ma'am for your beautiful introduction about me good afternoon everyone 
present here. I am very happy to present I am very happy to present my paper, Democracy, Empowerment of Higher Education Towards Sustainable Development of West Bengal. The outline of my today's talk is this. Democracy, which gives rise to social orientation or social development, which gives rise to capabilities, social orientation builds up capabilities and capabilities will give rise to sustainable development. I would like to see all these things, all these concepts from the context of West Bengal. See democracy. Democracy is coming from two root words, two Greek words, demos and kratos. Demos means people, kratos means power, the power of the people. That is democracy. When I look at the Amartya Sen, he insists these interpretations with regard to democracy. According to Amartya Sen, democracy means participatory democracy. Democracy means decision making left to the people. Democracy which will make or allow people to choose. Democracy will make people to have the authority to deliberate and decide legislation. So the idea of democracy with regard to, or according to Amartya Sen, is a very powerful concept. If the power is given to the people. Even when we look at the Indian constitution, article 19, which will talk about democracy, the power of the democracy, which is supposed to be enjoyed by each and every Indian. That is what is envisaged by Amartya Sen. Similar idea was also said by Roberto. Mangabeira is a Brazilian philosopher and a politician. In 1987, when he talks about a, a democracy, he says, empowered democracy. What Roberto Mangabeira was saying about a, a empowered democracy which is precisely articulated by Amartya Sen. Now let us see the democracy index. 
in india how the democracy has been practiced the economic the economic intelligence unit released its report on the state of democracy in 2021 across 165 independent countries and two territories two territories this report is based on five findings the electoral process and pluralism functioning of the government political participation political culture and civil liberties this report has been further bifurcated into a full democracy a flawed democracy then hybrid regime and authoritarian i have underlined a full democracy and then flawed democracy i am going to show in the next slide how the india is is ranked as a as a uh, flawed democracy so india is ranked 46 on the global index in the flawed democracy category with an overall score of 6.91 it has the lowest score of 5 on political culture and the highest score of 8.67 on electoral process and the pluralism the country scores 6.18 on civil liberties 7.22 on political participation and 7.50 on the functioning of the government now look at the look at the map here i am just showing the globe you can see authoritarian regime uh, regimes this from the dark saffron color to slowly it is uh, diminishing look at that then full democracy will be the dark and blue and the look at the india india map india in the map this is a very light blue is there so that is india has got a yeah, flawed democracy that is what is exhibited from this map okay now let us go to the this one next is next is right democracy which gives rise to social orientation or social development the in social development they normally say social development index sdi it has got five factors basic human needs that is nutritional and basic medical care water and and sanitation shelter personal safety and the security foundation of well being these are the factors which will constitute the basic human needs the the next factor is this access to knowledge third factor access to information and the communications then fourth factor environmental quality then fifth factor health and wellness these are the factors which will be constituting the uh, the social orientation or social development 
when we have their when we really enjoy the democracy definitely we will be able to attain this social orientation okay now we'll go to the next one social development index of india the social development index is based on three indicators basic human needs foundations of well being and opportunity basic human needs cover nutrition and basic medical care water and sanitation shelter and personal safety the the foundations of well being cover across to basic knowledge information and communications and the environmental quality opportunity relates to personal rights personal freedom and choice tolerance and inclusion and access to advanced education in 2020 india was 117th out of 163 countries with an spi score of 56.80 areas in which there is social progress are shelter and and access and access to information and then communication see from the results we can see where india figures with regard to the social development index now let us see this social development index of west bengal the west bengal also rates well in providing safe drinking water and the toilets as 94.6% households have safe drinking water as against 89.9% nationally while in the case of toilets 74.9% households have at least one as against 61.1% nationally now next one this social orientation builds up capabilities when we talk about capabilities that means capabilities not in terms of institutions but in terms of individuals we talk about capabilities only for individuals what is capability now the amartya sen says it is freedom that a person has to be are to do that is state of being or doing capability that to begin with because we can talk about so many capabilities so where to begin if i am not healthy as my being or doing freely is not possible therefore the capabilities will begin from health and education and all other capabilities will automatically follow so the most important capability is health the next one is education now let me let me see from the from the point of view of amartya sen the importance of health amartya sen says 
sometimes the most important things in life are least talked about. For example, health is virtually absent from public debates and domestic policies in India. Very, very sorry to hear this because this is what we experience. Normally people don't give importance to health. And the second one, it's hard to think anything more than anything more important than health for human well-being and the quality of life. Now let me see India's health insurance statistics among the number of people in India with health insurance. The distribution is not evenly spread among all the states. According to reports from 2019-20, Fewer than 40% of families in 11 Indian states are covered by health insurance products. We know from the National Family Health Survey, number five, which was conducted in 2019-20 data, that in Jammu and Kashmir, there are only 12.7% of households where at least one member is covered by general insurance. While in Bihar and Manipur, the percentages are 14.5 and 14.2 respectively. In Maharashtra, there is 20 percentage of households where at least one person has health insurance coverage. While in Nagaland, the percentage is 20.5. Sikkim, Karnataka and West Bengal are right next on the list with 25.7 with percentage, then 28 one percentage and 29.3 and percentage of households respectively. So we can say that uh, the West Bengal has got if the 29% is 29.3% only, this, uh, the healthy insurance scheme. And then from here we can see, uh, with regard to health aspect, as uh, how much importance is given and uh, how much importance we ourselves give, that is explicitly mentioned here. Okay, next one. As per the national family, see now I'm going to give the immunization, immunization. As per National Family Health Survey 4, 2015-16, in India, the national average for full immunization is 62%. Another coverage, the 78.4 percentage. And for, and for measles first dose, 81.1 percent. Some of the newer challenges in achieving full immunization coverage include limited capacities of staff, particularly in poor performing states and at the field level and gaps in key areas such as predicting demand as logistics, and cold chain management, which result in high wastage rates. India also lacks a robust system to track vaccine preventable diseases. Now we see where we are, how much importance we are giving to immunization. So this is what is portrayed here. The next one, the nutrition index. I am giving you the various indices with regard to the health aspect, where we stand in India as well as with regard to West Bengal. Okay, next one, the global nutrition, 
nutrition report is 2021. According to GMR 2021, on an estimated 6.2 percentage adult women aged 18 and above, and 3.2 percent adult men in India are living with obesity. Meanwhile, as diabetes is estimated to affect 9 percent of adult women and 10.2 percentage of adult men. India is eating a, a poor diet. A global Nutrition Report, it's a 2021 reported a, a comparison of the dietary intakes of key foods and the nutrients among adults aged, aged 25 uh, uh, and over with the minimum and the maximum targets. All these things we know that. Okay, now I'm going to show you the, uh, some graph. And before that, let me also say one more thing. The National Family Health Survey, the National Family Health Survey, the 2019-21, says about India has seen no significant improvement in health and the nutritional status among her population. The latest data shows 7.7% 7 .7 of children are, are severely wasted, uh, as 19.3% are wasted, and 35.5% are, are stunted. At the same time, 3.4% of children are overweight, which was 2.1% in NFHS4. The figure one is going to show. Then anemia among the children under five has become significantly worse with the current prevalence as 67.1% compared to 58.6% according to NFHS 4. 4.57% 4 of women of reproductive age are anemic in the country. So we can see that, uh, see that when we look at the whole statistics here, we can see how our health condition is deteriorating. Okay, next one, look at the, look at this one. The statistics, here the two types of statistics is there, number, number four and five, the health, the health scheme, okay, statistics. Anemia, a stunting, then wasting, then severely wasted, then overweight. Look at that. At one side, we can see 67.10% of people are there are suffering from anemia and they are all suffering from un undernutrition. And whereas 2.10 and then 3.40 percentage, they are all suffering from overweight. See the contrast in India itself. This is because of the unequal distribution of resources among the people. A vast majority of people are suffering un under, under nutrition. And a, a few percentage of people are really having overweight. Okay, next one. Uh, here also I see how the overweight among the men and the women. See how we see this one, uh, how much percentage of people are suffering from overweight in contrast to un, un, under nutrition is uh, experienced by a majority a majority of people here. Okay, next one. Look at the West Bengal status. In West Bengal, the nutritious uh, nutrition, see, look at that. See, 2015-16, it's 32.5. 2019-21, 33.8. this is the stunting percentage and the wasting percentage uh, is 20.3. 
in both the cases. Then un underweight percentage is 31.6 and then 32.6. There are two reports, four and five. Okay, the next one, women whose body mass index is below normal. This is the normal, this is the last one. It's 21.3 and the 14.8. See, you can see how the health condition is deteriorating among the vast majority of people of India and especially in West Bengal. Okay, next one. India is eating a poor diet. We can see that. The last, this one, the last verses I'm reading. Indian diet is significantly low in fruits, the legumes, the nuts, fish, and the, and the dairy that are crucial for an optimum growth and the development. See, look at that now. Here, this graph will show you what is the target. See, what is the target 100%? In what way we are all lacking in various things, in fruit, taking, vegetables, yeah, yeah, the legumes, the nuts, then whole grains, all the fish, all these things. See, we are all lagging behind in most of the cases. Okay. Now I'll go for the education. So far I have been talking about the importance of health and the, the, how, the, uh, how the status of health prevails in India. Now we'll go for the education. Rabindranath Tagore had an insightful remark. In my view, the imposing tower of uh, misery, which today rests on the heart of India has its sole foundation in the absence of education. Tagore's insight reveals the absence of education, how it affects the heart of India. The next one. So based on the, uh, this one insight of uh, Tagore, Amartya Sen and Zine Reyes uh, made this following comment. The role of basic education in, in the process of development and social progress is very wide and critically important. Okay, now, early education is a prerequisite for higher education. The higher education will provide an opportunity it, to move up. Once you receive the early education, the one who is educated will be able to move up fast. Then what is the cognitive ability? Early education gives the cognitive ability. Uh, uh, that's a, that is the uh, general uh, mental capability. The reading, writing, is learning, remembering, logical reasoning, and then paying attention. Unhealthy child cannot develop cognitive ability. The midday meals are given in schools to acquire good health and so improve education. Now look at that. Amartya Sen and, and Zeen Rees is emphatically stress the, follow, stress the following with regard to education. Capacity to read, write and count has the powerful effects of quality education. Our economic op opportunities and employment prospectus depend greatly on our education. The illiteracy muffles the political voice of the people, and so it leads to their insecurity. Basic education plays a major role in, in tackling health problems. Okay, educational development has been the prime mover in bringing about the changes in public perception of the range and the reach of what can be called human rights. Uh, so next one, education can make a difference on the understand, uh, to the understanding and the use of legal rights. The schooling of young women can substantially enhance the voice and the power women and, uh, and the power women in family decisions. See, see, education can make big contribution 
to reducing inequalities related to the divisions of class and caste the learning and the, and the studying can be immensely enjoyable and then creatively engaging activities and we see the the importance of education as we have been experiencing in various ways all those who are educated uh, see how they are able to go about the inequal inequal situation the inequality is slowly disappearing wherever the education grows the next one the literacy index according to the report published by the national survey of india the literacy rate of india in 20, in 2022 is 77.7 percentage the the literacy rate in in 2011 was 73 percentage there is an increase of 4 percentage compared to the last census data so this is what i just, this is uh, this something impressive this something positive the education uh, see index is slowly increasing in india okay next one you can see the uh, various states i am giving the literacy rate i am giving the male female look at west bengal in west bengal we can see Uh, 81.60% of literacy rate then male a uh, 70.54% then female 80.5% it is increasing see there is a there is a there is a positive development with regard to the literacy rate okay next one okay see now i see that with regard to the dropouts yeah the dropouts Yeah, yeah, the dropout index is uh, really alarming now. The dropouts is uh, really this is the problem in many of the states. And let me see because of the lack of time, let me go quickly. Yeah, yeah, the in West Bengal, yeah, the dropout among the boys was was fourteen point one percent, and that of the girls was thirteen point six percent in uh, in West Bengal between. 2019-20. Uh, this is the latest uh, statistics we have now. But the government has to take some initiatives with regard to the dropouts. And we could see that the the boys dropouts is more than the girls dropouts. Okay, next one. Well, capability. See, capabilities. Uh, capabilities implies sustainable development. Uh, capability is the prerequisite. for sustainability as what is sustainability as sustainable as a development is ecology and as environment oriented and now now we can see the sustainable development is not about natural resources sustainable development is not about natural resources but sustainability is about people's capabilities sustainability depends how human resources are is equally distributed then sustainability is not possible in a highly unequal situation okay next one uh, sustainable uh, see has to be sustainability has to be equitable and this idea we know very well equitable suppose suppose your mother has got two uh, two children okay one child is uh, okay the uh, let us say see see one child is is physically handicapped let us say they yeah, are differently able to child and the mother will give more attention to the differently able to child by doing this she is practicing the equitable the equitability there so that another child and this uh, the differently able to child will grow together but next one is a capability and the sustainability depend on how we treat young people as how we how we make the young people dream as how we make young people desire 
and how we make young people achieve by encouraging the young people for growing and achieving definitely we will be able to make this sustainability in a very active and an increasing mood now we'll go to the next one as a development means see uh, here i am going to talk about the development vis-a-vis -vis sustainability as a development means uh, not the development of the infrastructure but people's capability the uh, the goals of development and the sustainability are, are the same therefore that the uh, as a development and sustainability are the same concept are in the same concept level so development is freedom because according to amartya sen as a development is not meaningful without freedom okay now we can talk about the, the sustainability has got the sustainable development goals will have this the 17 goals will have no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, and the quality education, gender in need, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, and affordable and, and clean energy, and decent work and economic growth, and industry innovation and infrastructure, reduce inequality, and the sustainable cities and communities, etc., etc., et going on. There are 17 goals there. And now we would like to see. Okay, next we will see. Now the sustainable index. So what is the sustainable index of India and so on? So look at that. The India for the sustainable development index of India level six. Okay, uh, this one in the country it has got the index of sixty. The West Bengal was ranked as fourteenth among the twenty eight states in 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 two thousand nineteen. So this is the, this is the, these are the indicators. Then the Niti Ayok. And then this gives the, this one, this report like this. Now we will go to the next one. See, look at that. Uh, here we can see the various states. The poverty index. This is poverty index. <coughs> here I can talk about the various states. And finally, the West Bengal. Uh, look at that, 21.43. So this is the thing I want to say. The next one is the Global Hunger Index. The Hunger Index, we can see in the 2020 Global Hunger Index, India ranks uh, 107th out of the 121 countries. See, look at the, look at the data, 29.1. This is serious, serious level we are. The hunger index of India is in a serious condition. And we see that below, you see that low, moderate, serious, alarming, and extremely alarming. Look at the colors, various colors. This is demonstrated in, the, in this map. Look at this dark saffron color. It's uh, okay, very, it's very much alarming. Look at the, look at the various colors are are uh, are uh, given here in order to see the situation of hunger as prevailing in in various states of india okay now we'll go to the next one as gender inequality as causes of gender gender inequality poverty the women's illiteracy unemployment social conditions and beliefs these are the various uh, factors which are hampering, hampering the equal distribution of the resources in, in India. These are the these are the factors, the parameters are really hampering the growth of India. Okay, next one. Advantages of gender inequality, gender gender equality, gender equality prevents violence against women girls. The gender equality in India is good for the economy of the nation. 
gender equality in india is also fundamental as well as the human right of women gender equality in india makes our society safe and healthier now uh, now conclusion summarizing all those ideas that i have been sharing with you so far i would like to make two comments here universalizing the education is necessary and, and crucial for india and and west bengal in particular spreading mass literacy which is a basic requirement for economic development modernization of social structure and the effective functioning of democratic institution and the second one four pillars of sustainable development i would like to say this one is the social human economic and and then environmental i had already summarized the 17 goals of of sustainable development and all those 17 are summarized like this in in four uh, in four categories social human economic and the environmental when we are able to really increase the capabilities of every individual citizen of india we will be able to build up the four pillars of sustainable development in india and so we will be able to make a prosperous india thank you thank you sir uh, thank you for the so, so much for such a, a detailed and well documented presentation it is really thought provoking for us looking into some of the statistics that you have presented uh, we thank you for your presentation and if there are any questions from the audience can you put forward to father and in the meantime father uh, a question from my side what is the way out yeah what is the way out yes father yeah in india we see the uh, see every state as well as the national level we are trying to do something with regard to so increasing the health conditions and also to increase the educational level and one side we see the positive aspect i am not pessimistic i like to see the positive side but given the vast vast population it takes time and every state has to take some uh, some concrete steps it it to improve the health conditions as well as the educational uh, level of the individuals and so when we concentrate more and more so definitely we'll be able to achieve and we'll be able to build up the capabilities as well as the we'll be able to build up the sustainability of the individuals thank you so much father we are dot on time and uh, we would uh, we are concluding session uh, the last session thank you father so much at the conclusion of this seminar i would like to thank each one of you for joining this one day international virtual seminar on sustainable development public and private finance and leadership i immensely thank all the speakers all the participants of this seminar i thank the faculty members officers support staff of st jivyas university kolkata for making this event a huge success namaskar to all of you thank you ma'am we conclude this seminar Thank you.